I wonder what you mean when you use the word I. I've been very interested in this problem for a long, long time. And I've come to the conclusion that what most civilized people mean by that word is a hallucination. That is to say, a false sense of personal identity that is at complete variance with the facts of nature. And as a result of having a false sense of identity, we act in a way that is inappropriate to our natural environment. And when that inappropriate way of action is magnified by a very powerful technology, we swiftly begin to see the results of a profound discord between man and nature. As is well known, we are now in the process of destroying our environment as a result of an attempt to conquer it and master it. And we have not realized, therefore, that our environment is not something other than ourselves. In assuming that it is, we have made a great mistake and are now paying the price for it. But most people would agree with the lines of the poet who said, I, a stranger and afraid, in a world I never made. Because we have the strong sensation that our own being inside our skin is extremely different from the world outside our skin. That while there may be intelligence inside human skins, and while there may be values and loving feelings, outside the skin is a world of mechanical process which does not give a damn about any individual and which is basically unintelligent being gyrations of blind force and so far as the merely biological world is concerned gyrations of libido which is Freud's word for blind lust it should be obvious that the human being goes with the rest of the universe. Even though we say in popular speech, I came into this world. Now it is not true that you came into this world. You came out of it. In the same way as a flower comes out of a plant or a fruit comes out of a tree. And as an apple tree apples, the solar system in which we live, and therefore the galaxy in which we live, and therefore the system of galaxies in which we live, that system peoples. And therefore people are an expression of its energy and of its nature. If people are intelligent, and I suppose we have to grant that if, then the energy which people express must also be intelligent because one does not gather figs from thistles and grapes from thorns. But it does not occur, you see, to the ordinary civilized person to regard himself or herself as an expression of the whole universe. It should be obvious that we cannot exist except in an environment of earth, air, water, and solar temperature, that all these things go with us and are as important to us, albeit outside our skins, as our internal organs, heart, stomach, brain, and so forth. 
Now if then we cannot describe the behavior of organisms without at the same time describing the behavior of their environments, we should realize that we have a new entity of description. Not the individual organism alone, but what would now be called a field of behavior, which we must call rather clumsily the organism environment. You go with your environment in the same way as your head goes with the rest of your body. You do not find in nature faces arriving in the world sui generis. They go with a body, but also bodies do not arrive in a world uh, which would be, for example, a plain ball of scrubbed rock floating without an atmosphere far away from a star. That will not grow bodies. There is no soil for bodies. There is no complexity of environment, which is body producing. So bodies go with a very complicated natural environment. And if the head goes with the body and the body goes with the environment, the body is as much an integral part of the environment as the head is part of the body. It is deceptive, of course, because the human being is not rooted to the ground like a tree. A human being moves about and therefore can shift from one environment to another. But these shifts are superficial. The basic environment of the planet remains a constant. And if the human being leaves the planet, he has to take with him an, a, a canned version of the planetary environment. Now, we are not really aware of this. Upon taking thought and due consideration, it does occur to us, yes, indeed, we do need that environment. But in the ordinary way, we don't feel it. That is to say, we don't have a vivid sensation of belonging to our environment in the same way that we have a vivid sensation of, a sensation of being an ego inside a bag of skin located mostly in the skull, about halfway between the ears and a little way behind the eyes. And it issues in these disastrous results of the ego, which, according to 19th century common sense, feels that it is a fluke in nature, and that if it does not fight nature, it will not be able to maintain its status as intelligent fluke. So the geneticists are now saying, and many others are now saying, that man must take the course of his evolution into his own hands, he can no longer trust the wiggly, random, and uh, unintelligible processes of nature to develop him any further, but he must interfere with his own intelligence and through genetic alterations breed the kind of people who will be viable for human society and that sort of thing. Now this, I submit, is a ghastly error. Because human intelligence has a very serious limitation. That limitation is that it is a scanning system of conscious attention which is linear. That is to say, it examines the world in lines rather as you would pass the beam of a flashlight across a room, a spotlight. That's why our education takes so long. It takes so long because we have to scan miles of lines of print. And we regard that, you see, as basic information. Now the universe does not come at us in lines. It comes at us in a multidimensional continuum in which everything is happening all together everywhere at once. And it comes at us much too quickly to be translated 
into lines of print or of other information, however fast they may be scanned. And that is our limitation so far as the intellectual life, the scientific life is concerned. The computer will greatly speed up linear scanning, but it's still linear scanning. And so long as we are stuck with that form of wisdom, we cannot deal with more than a few variables at once. Now, what do I mean by that? What is a variable? A variable is any one linear process. Let's take music. When you play a Bach fugue and there are four parts to it, you have four variables. You have four moving lines, and you can take care of that with two hands. An organist using two feet can put in two more variables and have six going. And you may realize, if you've ever tried to play the organ, that it's quite difficult to make six independent motions go at once. The average person cannot do that without training. The average person cannot deal with more than three variables at once without using a pencil. Now, when we study physics, we are dealing with processes in which there are millions of variables. This, however, we handle by statistics, in the same way as insurance companies use actuarial tables to predict when most people will die. If the average age of death is 65, however, this prediction does not apply to any given individual. Any given individual will live to plus or minus 65 years. And the range of difference may be very wide indeed, of course. But this is all right. The 65 guess is all right when you're doing large-scale gambling. And that's the way the physicist works in predicting the behavior of nuclear wavicles. But the practical problems of human life deal with variables in the hundreds of thousands. Here, st statistical methods are very poor. And thinking it out by linear consideration is impossible. With that equipment, then, we are proposing to interfere with our genes. And with that equipment also, be it said, we are trying to solve our political, economic and social problems. And naturally, everybody has the sense of total frustration. And the individual feels, well, what on earth can I do? We do not seem to know a way of calling upon our brains. Because our brains can handle an enormous number of variables that are not accessible to the process of conscious attention. Your brain is now handling or your total nervous system, to be more accurate. Your blood chemistry, the secretions from your glands, the behavior of millions of cells. It is doing all that without thinking about it. That is to say, without translating the processes it is handling into consciously reviewed words, symbols, or numbers. Now, when I use the word thinking, I mean precisely that process, translating what is going on in nature into words, symbols, or numbers. Of course, uh, both words and numbers are kinds of symbols. Symbols bear the same relation to the real world that money bears to wealth. You cannot quench anybody's thirst with the word water, just as you cannot eat a dollar bill and derive nutrition. But using symbols and using conscious intelligence, scanning, has proved very useful to us. It has given us such technology as we have. But at the same time, it has proved too much of a good thing. At the same time, we
we've become so fascinated that we confuse the world as it is with the world as it is thought about, talked about, and figured about. That is to say, with the world as it is described. And the difference between these two is vast. And when we are not aware of ourselves, except in a symbolic way, we are not related to ourselves at all. We are like people eating menus instead of dinners. And that's why we all feel psychologically frustrated. So then we get back to the question of uh, what do we mean by I? Well, first of all, obviously, we mean our symbol of ourselves. Now, ourselves, in this case, is the whole psychophysical organism, conscious and unconscious, plus its environment. That's your real self. Your real self, in other words, is the universe as centered on your organism. That's you. You say, uh, let me just clarify that a little for one reason. What you do is also a doing of your environment. Your behavior is its behavior as much as its behavior is your behavior. It's mutual. We could say it is transactional. You are not a puppet which your environment pushes around. Nor is the environment a puppet which you push around. They go together. They act together. In the same way, for example, if I have a wheel, one side of it going down is the same as the other side of it going up. When you handle the steering wheel of a car, are you pulling it or are you pushing it? No, you're doing both, aren't you? When you pull it down this side, you are pushing it up that side. It's all one. So there's a push-pull between organism and environment. We are only rarely aware of this as when in curious alterations of consciousness, which we call mystical experience, cosmic consciousness, an individual gets the feeling that everything that is happening is his own doing or the opposite of that feeling, that he isn't doing anything, but that all his doings, his decisions and so forth, are happenings of nature. You can feel it either way. You can describe it in these two completely opposite ways, but you're talking about the same experience. You're talking about experiencing your own activity and the activity of nature as one single process. And you can describe it as if you were omnipotent like God, or as if it were completely deterministic and you hardly existed at all. But remember, both points of view are right. We'll see where that gets us. But we don't feel that, do we, ordinarily? What we feel instead is an identification of ourselves with our idea of ourselves. Or I would rather say, with our image of ourselves. And that's the person or the ego. You play a role. You identify with that role. I play a role. It's called Alan Watts. And I know very well that that's a big act. <clears throat> I can play some other roles besides Alan Watts if necessary. But I find that this one is better for making a living. <laughs> But I assure you, it's a mask, and I don't take it seriously. <laughs> you know, the idea of my being a kind of messiah or guru or savior of the world just breaks me up. Because <laughs> I know me. <laughs> Though I, you know, it's very difficult to be holy. In the ordinary sense. So I know I'm not that. But most of us are taught to think that we are whom we are called. And when you're a little child and you begin to learn a role, 
and your parents and your peers approve of your being that. They know who you are. You're predictable. So you can be controlled. But when you act out of role and you imitate some other child's behavior, everybody points the finger and says, you're not being true to yourself. Johnny, that's not you, that's Peter. <laughs> and so you learn to stay Peter or to stay Johnny. But of course, you're not either. Because this is just the image of it. It's as much of you as you can get into your conscious attention, which is precious little. Your image of yourself contains no information about how you structure your nervous system. It contains no information about your blood chemistry. It contains almost no information about the subtle influences of society upon your behavior. It does not include the basic assumptions of your culture, which are all taken for granted and unconscious. You can't find them out unless you study other cultures to see how their basic assumptions differ. It includes all kinds of illusions that you're completely unaware of, as for example, that time is real and that there is such a thing as a past, which is pure hokum. But nevertheless, all these things are unconscious in us and they are not included in our image of ourselves, nor of course included in our image of ourselves. Is there any information about our inseparable relationships with the whole natural universe? So uh, this is a very impoverished image. When you ask a person, what did you do yesterday? They'll give you a historical account of a certain number of events in which they participated, a certain number of things which they saw, used or were clobbered by. But realize at once that this history leaves out most of what happened. I, in trying to describe what happens to me this evening, will never be able to describe it. Because there are so many people here that if I were to talk about everyone whom I've seen, what they were wearing, what color their hair was, what sort of expressions they had on their faces, I would have to talk till doomsday. So instead of this rich physical experience, which is very rich indeed, I have to attenuate it in memory and description, saying, oh, I met a lot of people in Philadelphia. And there were men and there were women and lots of them were young and some of them were old. You know, it's the most utterly impoverished account of what went on. So therefore, in thinking of ourselves in this way, what I did yesterday, what I did the day before, in terms of this stringy, mangy account, all I have is a caricature of myself. And you know the caricaturist doesn't draw you all in, he just puts certain salient features whereby people will recognize it. It's not a skeleton. So we, can, can, we are, as it were, conceiving ourselves as a bunch of skeletons. And they got no flesh on it, just a bunch of bones. And no wonder we all feel inadequate. We're all looking for something to the future, to bring us a goodie. We know we ought to have, there's a golden goodie at the end of the line somewhere. There's a good time coming, be it ever so way, far away, that one far off divine event to which all creation moves. We hope. <laughs> and therefore we say of something that's no good, it has no future. I would say it has no present. But everybody says it has no future. Now, here we are, as it were, psychically starved. And always, therefore, looking for, looking, seeking, seeking, seeking. And this confused seeking is going on everywhere. We don't know what we want. Nobody knows what they want. We say, yes, we, th we think of what we want in vague terms. Pleasure, money, wealth, love, um, fulfillment, personal development. But we don't know what we mean by all that. The person really sits down to figure out, write a long essay, 20 pages, on your idea of heaven. It'll be a sorry production. You can see it already in medieval art. 
whether it did pictures of heaven and hell. Hell is always much better than heaven. Although it's uncomfortable, it's a sadomasochistic orgy. Wow, e you know, hell is really rip roaring. Whereas all the saints in heaven are sitting. You know, very, very smug and demure like they were in church. And you see also the, the multitudes of the saved. Instead of this writhing, wormy thing, you can see all their heads, which the artist has drawn to abbreviate them, just the tops of their heads in masses. They look like cobblestone street. Flattened out. So, what has happened then is this. That our eye is an illusion. It's an image. And it is no more ourself than an idol is the Godhead. But we say, it can't be so because I feel I really exist. It isn't just an idea in my head, it's a feeling, I feel me. But what is it that you feel when you feel I? But what is it that you feel when you feel I? I'll tell you. What do you do when somebody says, pay attention? What is uh, the difference between looking at something and taking a hard look at it? Or between hearing something and listening intently? What's the difference? What's the difference between waiting while something goes on and enduring it? Why? The difference is this, that when you pay attention, instead of just looking, you screw up your face, you frown and stare. That is a muscular activity around here. When you will, you grit your teeth or clench your fists. When you endure or control yourself, you pull yourself together, physically, and therefore you get uptight. You hold your breath. You do all kinds of muscular things to control the functioning of your nervous system. And none of them have the slightest effect on the proper operation of the nervous system. If you stare at things, you will rather fuzz the image than see them clearly. If you listen intently by concentrating on muscles around the ears, you will be so much attending to muscles here that you won't hear things properly. You may get singing in the ears. If you tighten up with your body to pull yourself together, all you do is constrict yourself. I remember in school, I sat next to a boy who had great difficulty in learning to read. And what they always say to children is, try. If you can't do something, you must try. So the boy tries, and what has he done? When he's trying to get out words, he grunts and groans as if he were lifting weights. And the teacher's impressed. The boy is really trying. Gives him B for effort. <laughs> oh, he's doing it. <laughs> Has nothing to do with it. Now, we all make this muscular straining with the thought that it's achieving psychological results. The sort of psychological results it's intended to achieve. Now all this amounts to is this, like you're taking off in a jet plane. You've got a, a mile down the runway and the thing isn't up in the air yet, you get nervous. So you start pulling at your seatbelt. That's what it is. Now that is a chronic feeling. We have it in us all the time and it corresponds to the word I. That's what you feel when you say I. You feel that chronic tension. Because when an organ is working properly, you don't feel it. If you see your eye, you've got cataract. If you hear your ears, you've got singing in your ears, you know, getting in the way of hearing. When you are fully functioning, you are unaware of the organ. When you're thinking clearly, your brain isn't getting in your way. Actually, of course, you are seeing your eyes in the sense that everything you see out in front of you is 
a condition in the optic nerves at the back of the skull. That's where you're aware of all this. But you're not aware of the eye as the eye. I'm talking about the optical eye. So when we are aware of the ego eye, we are aware of this chronic tension inside ourselves. And that's not us. It's a futile tension. So when we get the illusion, the image of ourselves, married to a futile tension, you've got an illusion married to a futility. And then you wonder why I can't do anything. Why I feel in the face of all the problems of the world impotent. And why I somehow cannot manage to transform I. Now here we get to the real problem. Because we're always telling each other that we should be different. Now, I'm not going to tell you that tonight. Why not? Because I know you can't. Nor can I. That may sound depressing, but I'll show you it isn't. It's very heartening. <clears throat> but everybody, you see, who is at all sensitive and awake to their own problems and human problems is trying to change himself. We know we can't change the world unless we change ourselves. If we are all individually selfish, we're going to be collectively selfish. If we don't really love people and only pretend to, somehow we've got to find a way to love. After all, it's said in the Bible, thou shalt love the Lord thy God and your neighbor as yourself. You must love. Yeah, we all agree. Sure. But we don't. In fact, one psychologist very smartly asked a patient, with whom are you in love against? <laughs> and this, this particularly becomes appalling when we enter into the realm of higher things, by which I mean spiritual development. Everybody these days is interested in spiritual development. And uh, wisely, because we want to change our consciousness. Many people are well aware that this egocentric consciousness is a hallucination. And that uh, they presume it's the function of religion to change it. Because that's what the Zen Buddhists and yogis and all these people in the Orient are doing. They are changing their state of consciousness to get something called Satori, or mystical experience, or Nirvana, or Moksha, or what have you. And everybody around here is really enthused about that because uh, the, you don't get that in church. I mean, there have been Christian mystics, but the church has been very quiet about them. <laughs> In the average church, all you get is talk. There's no meditation, no spiritual discipline. They tell God what to do interminably, as if he didn't know. And then they tell the people what to do, as if they could or even wanted to. And then they sing religious nursery rhymes. <laughs> and then, to, to, to cap it all, the Roman Catholic Church, which did at least have an unintelligible service, which was, <laughs> which was, you know, it was real mysterious and suggested vast magic going on. They went and put the thing into bad English. And they took away incense and they took away, they became a bunch of Protestants. And the thing was just terrible. So now all these Catholics are at loose ends. As Claire Booth Luce put it, not to be a pun, but she said, you know, <laughs> it's no longer possible to practice contemplative prayer at Mass. Because you're being advised, exhorted, edified all the time. And it becomes a bore. Sing of God listening to all those prayers. I mean, do have, I mean, talking about grieving the Holy Spirit. <laughs> it's just awful. People have no consideration for God at all. So, but in, in, Pursuing these spiritual disciplines, yoga and Zen and so forth, and also psychotherapy, there comes up a big difficulty. 
And the big difficulty is this. I want to find a method whereby I can change my consciousness. But the, therefore, to improve myself. But the, the self that needs to be improved is the one that is doing the improving. And so I'm rather stuck. I find out the reason that I think I believe, say, in God, is that I sure hope that somehow God will rescue me. In other words, I want to hang on to my own existence. And I feel rather shaky about doing that for myself, but I just hope there's a God who will take care of it. Or, if I could be loving, I would have a better opinion of myself. I'd feel better about it. I could face myself, as people say, if I were more loving. So, the unloving me, somehow, by some gimmickry, has to turn itself into a loving me, and this is just like trying to lift yourself off the ground with your own bootstraps. It can't be done. And that's why religion, in practice, mainly produces hypocrisy and guilt because of the constant failure of these enterprises. Now, people go and study Zen and they come back and say, wow, getting rid of your ego is a superhuman task. I assure you it's going to be very, very difficult to get rid of your ego. You're going to have to sit for a long time and you're going to get the sorest legs. It's hard work. All you wretched kids who think you're getting rid of your ego on part or something or other, and, uh, easy yoga, you don't know what you're in for when it really comes down to the nitty gritty. You know, the biggest ego trip going is getting rid of your ego. <laughs> And the joke of it all is your ego doesn't exist. <laughs> There's nothing to get rid of. It's an illusion, as I tried to explain. But you still want to ask how to stop the illusion. Now, who's asking? I mean, do you think, in the ordinary sense in which you use the word I, how can I stop identifying myself with the wrong me? <laughs> well, the answer is simply you can't. Now, the Christians put this in their way when they say that mystical experience is a gift of divine grace. Man, as such, cannot achieve this experience. It is a gift of God, and if God doesn't give it to you, there's no way of getting it. Now, that is solidly true. You can't do anything about it because you don't exist. Well, you say, that's pretty depressing news. <laughs> but the whole point is it isn't depressing news. It is the joyous news. There's a Zen poem which puts it like this, talking about it. It means the mystical experience, Satori, the realization that you are the eternal energy of the universe like Jesus did. It says like this, you cannot catch hold of it, nor can you get rid of it. In not being able to get it, you get it. When you speak, it's silent. When you're silent, it's peace. Now, in not being able to get it, you get it. Because this whole feeling, what Krishnamurti is trying to explain to people, for example, when he says, uh, why do you ask for a method? There is no method. All methods are simply um, gimmicks for strengthening your ego. So how do we not do that? He says, you're still asking for a method. There is no method. If you really understand what your I is, you will see there is no method. This is so, so sad. But it's not. This is the gospel, the good news. Because if you cannot achieve it, if you cannot transform yourself, that means that the main obstacle to 
mystical vision has collapsed. That was you. What happens? You can't do anything about it. You're at your wit's end. What are you going to do? Commit suicide? Well, supposing you just put that off for a little while. Wait and see what happens. You can't control your thoughts. You can't control your feelings because there is no controller. You are your thoughts and your feelings. They're running along, running along, running along. Just sit and watch them. There they go. You're still breathing, aren't you? Still growing your hair? Still seeing and hearing? Are you doing that? I mean, is, is breathing something that you do? <laughs> do you see? I mean, do you organize the operations of your eyes? Know exactly how to work those rods and cones in the retina? Do you do that? It's a happening. It happens. So you can feel all this happening. Your breathing is happening. Your thinking is happening. Your feeling is happening. You're hearing, you're seeing. The clouds are happening across the sky. The sky is happening blue. The sun is happening shining. There it is. All this happening. And may I introduce you? This is yourself. This begins to be a vision of who you really are. That's the way you function. You function by happening, that is to say, by spontaneous occurrence. And this is not a state of affairs that you should realize. I cannot possibly preach it to you because the minute you start thinking, I should understand that, this is this stupid notion again of I should bring it about when there is no you to bring it about. See, that's why I'm not preaching. You can only preach to egos. All I can do is to talk about what is. It amuses me to talk about what is because it's wonderful. I love it, and therefore I like to talk. If I get paid for it, then I make my living. Sensible people get paid for doing what they enjoy doing. So this is not on a, you see, this is the whole approach here is not to convert you, not to make you over, not to improve you, but for you to discover that if you really knew the way you are, things would be, would be sane. But you see, you can't do that. You can't make that discovery because you're in your own way. So long as you think, I'm I. So long as that hallucination blocks it. And the hallucination disappears only in the realization of its own futility. When at last you see, you can't do it. You cannot make yourself over. You cannot really control your own mind. See, when we try to control the mind, a lot of yoga teachers try to get you to control your own mind, mainly to prove to you that you can't do it. There's nothing, you know, a fool who persists in his folly will become wise. So they, what they do is they speed up the folly. And so you get concentrated. And uh, you can have a certain amount of superficial and initial success by a process commonly called self-hypnosis. And you can think you're making progress. And a good teacher will let you go along that way for a while until he really throws you with one. Why are you concentrating? See, Buddhism works this way. Buddha said, if you suffer, you suffer because you desire. And your desires are either unattainable or always being disappointed or something. So cut out desire. So those disciples went away and they stamped on desire, jumped on desire, cut the throat of desire and threw out desire. But then they came back and Buddha said, but you are still desiring not to desire. <laughs> and they wanted how to get rid of that. So when you see that that's nonsense, 
there naturally comes over you a quietness. In seeing that you cannot control your mind, you realize there is no control. What you took to be the thinker of thoughts is just one of the thoughts. What you took to be the feeler of the feelings, which was that chronic muscular strain, is just one of the feelings. What you took to be the experiencer of experience is just a part of the experience. So there isn't any thinker of thoughts, feeler of feelings. We, we get into that bind because we have a grammatical rule that verbs have to have subjects. And the funny thing about that is that verbs are processes and subjects are nouns which are supposed to be things. How does a noun start a verb? How does a thing put a process into action? Obviously it can't. But we always insist that there is this subject called the knower. And without a knower there can't be knowing. Well that's just a grammatical rule, it isn't a rule of nature. In nature there's just knowing. Like you're feeling it. And I have to say you are feeling it as if you were somehow different from the feeling. When I say I am feeling, what I mean is there is feeling here. When I say you are feeling, I mean there is feeling there. I have to say even there is feeling. What a cumbersome language we have. Chinese is easier. You don't have to put all that in. Or you can say things twice as fast in Chinese as you can in any other language. Well anyway, when you come to see that you can do nothing, that the play of thought, of feeling, etc. just goes on by itself as a habit. Then you are in a state which we will call meditation. And slowly, without being pushed, your thoughts will come to silence. That is to say, all the verbal symbolic chatter going on in the skull. Don't try and get rid of it, because that will again produce the illusion that there's a controller. Just, it, it goes on, it goes on, it goes on, finally it gets tired of itself and bored and stops. And so then there's a silence. And this is a deeper level of meditation. And in that silence, you suddenly begin to see the world as it is. And you don't see any past, you don't see any future. You don't see any difference between yourself and the rest of it. That's just an idea. You can't put your hand on the difference between myself and you. You know, you can't blow it, you can't bounce it, you can't pull it. It's just an idea. You can't find any material body. Because material body is an idea, so is spiritual body, it's somebody's philosophical notions. See, reality isn't material, that's an idea. Reality isn't spiritual, that's an idea. Reality is... So, we find, if I've got to put it back into that we live in an eternal now. You've got all the time in the world because you've got all the time there is, which is now. And uh, you are this universe. And you feel the strange feeling when, when, when ideas don't define the differences. You feel that other people's doings are your doings. And that makes it very difficult to blame other people. If you're not sophisticated theologically, you may of course run screaming in the streets and say that you're God. In a way that's what happened to Jesus because he wasn't sophisticated theologically. He only had Old Testament biblical theology behind him. If he'd had Hindu the theology, he could have put it more subtly. But uh, it was only that rather primitive theology of the Old Testament. And that was a conception of God as a monarchical boss. And you can't go around and say, I'm the boss's son. If you're going to say, I'm God, 
you must allow it for everyone else too. But this was a heretical idea from the point of view of Hebrew theology. So what they did with Jesus was they pedestalized him. That means kicked him upstairs so that he wouldn't be able to influence anyone else. And uh, only you may be God. And uh, that stopped the gospel cold right at the beginning. It couldn't spread. Well, anyway. This is therefore to say that the transformation of human consciousness through meditation is frustrated. So long as we think of it in terms of something that I myself can bring about by some kind of wangle, by some sort of gimmick. Because you see that leads to endless games of spiritual one-upmanship and of guru competitions. Of my guru is more effective than your guru. My yoga is faster than your yoga. I'm more aware of myself than you are. I'm humbler than you are. I'm sorrier for my sins than you are. I love you more than you love me. There's this interminable goings on about which people fight and wonder whether they are a little bit more evolved than somebody else and so on. All that can just fall away. And then we get this strange feeling that we have never had, you see, in our lives, except occasionally by accident. Some people get a glimpse that we are no longer this poor little stranger and afraid in a world it never made. But that you are this universe and you are creating it at every moment. Because you see it starts now. It didn't begin in the past. There was no past. See, if the universe began in the past, when that happened it was now. See, well it's still now. And the universe is still beginning now and it's trailing off like the wake of a ship from now. And that wake of the ship fades out, so does the past. You can look back there to explain things, but the explanation disappears. You'll never find it there. Things are not explained by the past. They're explained by what happens now. That creates the past. It begins here. That's the birth of responsibility. Because otherwise, you can always look over your shoulder and say, well, I'm the way I am because my mother dropped me. And she dropped me because she was neurotic, because her mother dropped her. <laughs> now, away we go back to Adam and Eve or to a disappearing monkey or something. We never get at it. But in this way, you're, you're faced with it. You're doing all this. And that's an extraordinary shock. So, cheer up. You can't blame anyone else for the kind of world you're in. And if you know, you see, that I, in the sense of the person, the front, the ego, it really doesn't exist, then it won't go to your head too badly if you wake up and discover that you're God. It's very commonly said that the root of most human unhappiness is the sense that one's life has no meaning. This is, I suppose, most frequently said in circles interested in psychotherapy because the feeling of meaninglessness is often equated with the existence of neurosis. And so many activities into which one is encouraged to enter, philosophies one is encouraged to believe, and religions one is encouraged to join, are commended on the, on the basis of the fact that they give life a meaning. And I think it's very fascinating to think of what this idea itself means, or what it is intended when it's said that uh, life has to have a purpose. I remember so well as a child listening to sermons in church 
in which the preacher would constantly refer to God's purpose for you and for me. And I could never make out what it was because when questioned about this, the reverend gentleman seemed to be evasive. What is the purpose of God for the world? We used to sing a hymn too. God is working his purpose out as year succeeds the year. And uh, the nearest clue one got to it was in the sort of um, refrain of the hymn. Nearer and nearer draws the time, the time that shall surely be, when the earth shall be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. And of course that raises the question, what is the glory of God? Well now, it's pretty obvious, I think, that when we talk about life having or not having a meaning, we're not using quite the ordinary sense of the word meaning as the attribute of a sign. We're not saying, are we, that we expect this natural universe to behave as if it were a collection of words signifying something other than themselves. It isn't a point of view which would reduce our lives and the world merely to the status of signs. And it's obviously in some different sense than that <clears throat> that Goethe wrote his famous lines at the end of Faust. Alles vergänglicher ist nur ein Gleichnis. Forgive my pronunciation of German. All that is mortal or all that is perishable is but a symbol. And so, a symbol of what? What do we want to feel? What would satisfy us as being the meaning behind this world? It's so often, you know, that we don't follow our ideas and our desires through. Most of the things that we want very fervently are things that we've only half glimpsed. Our ideals are very often suggestions, hints, and we don't know really exactly what we mean when we think about it. But there is this obscure sense in which we feel that life ought to have significance and be a symbol in at least that sense, if not just so uh, buried a symbol as a mere sign. Or it also may mean that life is meaningful. An individual feels that his life amounts to something when he belongs and fits in with the execution of some uh, group enterprise. He feels he belongs in a plan. And this too seems to give people a sense of great satisfaction. But we have to pursue that question further too. Why is it that a plan, why is it that a fellowship with other people gives the sense of meaning? Does it come down perhaps to another sense of meaning? That life is felt to be meaningful when one is fully satisfying one's biological urges. Uh, including uh, the sense of hunger, the sense of love, the sense of uh, self-expression in activity, and so on. But then again, we have to push that inquiry further. What do our biological urges really point towards? Are they just, however, Things always projected towards a future is biology and its uh, processes nothing but going on towards going on towards going on. Or there's a fourth and more theological sense of the meaning of life. In all theistic religions at any rate, the meaning of life is God himself. In other words, all this world means a person. It means a heart, it means an intelligence. And the relationship of love between God and man is the meaning of the world. The sight of God is the glory of God, and so on. But again here, there's something to be further pursued. What is it that we want in 
love with a person and even a person in the sense of the Lord God. What is the content of it? What is it that we are really yearning after? Well now, if we go back to the first point, taking Goethe's words that all that is transitory is but a symbol, and that we want to feel that all things have significance, it does seem to me that there's a sense in which we often use the word significance, where the word seems to be chosen quite uh, naturally, and yet at the same time it's not quite the right word. We say, for example, often of music, that we feel it to be significant. When just at the same time we don't mean that it expresses some particular kind of concretely realizable emotion, and certainly it's not imitating the noises of nature. The program music, you know, would simply uh, imitate something else and it deliberately sets out to express sadness or joy or whatever uh, is not the kind of thing I mean. So often when one listens to the beautiful arabesque character of uh, the Baroque composers, Bach or Vivaldi, it is felt to be significant, not because it means something other than itself, but because it is so satisfying as it is. And we use then this word significance. So often, in those moments when uh, our impetuous seeking for fulfillment cools down, and we give ourselves a little space to watch things, as if they were worth watching, ordinary things. And in those moments when our inner turmoil has really quietened, we find significance in things that we wouldn't expect to find significant at all. I mean, this is after all the art of those photographers who have such genius in turning the camera towards such things as peeling paint on an old door or mud and sand and stones on a dirt road and showing us there that if we look at it in a certain way, those things are significant. But we can't say significant of what so much as significant of themselves. Or perhaps significance then is the quality of a state of mind in which we notice that we're overlooking the significance of the world by our constant quest for it later. All this language is, of course, quite naturally vague and imprecise because I think the wrong word is used. And yet not entirely the wrong word because, as I said, it comes so naturally to us. Uh, it was Clive Bell, the great aesthetician, who wanted to say that all the characteristic of art, especially the characteristic of um, aesthetic success in painting, was the creation of significant form. Again, a very vague, imprecise expression. But it certainly is an attribute, not only of those moments in which we are tranquil inside, but also of moments of deep spiritual experience of what would be called a moksha or release in Hinduism or Satori in Zen. That in those moments, the significance of the world seems to be the world seems to be what is going on now. And we don't look any further. The scheme of things seems to justify itself at every moment of its unfoldment. I pointed out that this was particularly a characteristic of music. It's also a characteristic of dancing. And in the sensation of belonging with one's fellow men, in the carrying out of some significant pattern of life, uh, which I mentioned as a second sense of the world being meaningful. Again, the character of this feeling is, again, something that is fulfilled in itself. 
to dance is not to be going anywhere. When we dance in the ballroom, we don't have a destination, we're just going around the room. And it's in doing this, it's in executing the pattern, in singing the music with other people, that even though this doesn't point to anything outside itself, we again get the sense of meaning. And this is also obviously the case so often in the satisfaction of the biological urges. Does one live to eat or eat to live? I'm not at all sure about this. I'm sure I very often live to eat because uh, sitting around a table with people, I don't like eating alone, and uh, enjoying food is absolutely delightful. And uh, we're not thinking when we do this, at least certainly I'm not, that we have to eat because it's good for us. And uh, we've got to throw something down the hatch, as Henry Miller said, and swallow a dozen vitamins, uh, just because uh, our system needs nourishment. I remember quite recently there was an article in the Consumer Reports about bread. And um, there had been some correspondence and protests saying that the bread one bought, white bread one buys in the stores, is uh, perfectly inedible and lacking in nutrition. And that uh, it was much better to eat um, peasant type breads, rough pumpernickel and things of that kind and the experts replied that uh, our white bread is perfectly full of good nutrients and uh, there's nothing really the matter with it at all. Well I felt like saying it isn't a matter perhaps of the bread being deficient in the essential vitamins. Bread isn't medicine, it's food and one's complaint against it is that it's bad cookery. It tastes of nothing and uh, we do tend, don't we, to look upon food so often for what it will do for us rather than the delight of, of eating it. But if the satisfaction of biological urges is to mean anything, surely the point of these urges is not the fatuous one of mere survival, of we might say the, the point of the individual is simply that he contributes to the, to the welfare of the race. And uh, the point of the race is that it reproduces itself, to reproduce itself, to reproduce itself and keep going. Now that isn't really a point at all. That's just fatuous. Surely the race keeps going because going is great, because it's fun. And if it isn't, and never will be, then there's no point, obviously, in going. I mean, looking at it from the most hedonistic standpoint. But then when we come to the question, what is fun? What is the joy of it? Again, we come down to something that can't very well be explained in the ordinary language of meaning, of leading to something else. And this, I think, becomes preeminently true if we think of it in theological language that the meaning of life is God. In any of the theistic religions, what is God doing? What is the meaning of God? Why does he create the universe? What is the content of the love of God for his creation? Well, there's the frank answer of the Hindus that the Godhead manifests the world because of Leela which is the Sanskrit word for play. And this is likewise said in the, uh, in the Hebrew uh, scriptures or the Christian Old Testament, in the book of Proverbs, where there is a marvelous speech by the divine wisdom, Sophia, which in describing the function of the divine wisdom in the creation of the world, the world in other words is a manifestation of the wisdom of God. A wisdom uses the phrase, that in uh, producing men and animals and all the creatures of the earth, wisdom is playing. And it was the, the, the delight of wisdom to play before the presence of God. The wisdom of God. A wisdom uses the phrase that in uh, 
producing men and animals and all the creatures of the earth. Wisdom is playing, and it was the, the, the delight of wisdom to play before the presence of God. And when it is likewise said uh, in the scriptures that the Lord God created the world for his pleasure, uh, this again means, in a sense, for play. And certainly this seems to be what the uh, angels in heaven are doing according to the traditional uh, symbolic descriptions of heaven. They are uh, ringed around the presence of the Almighty, calling out, Alleluia, 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 through all eternity. Well, Alleluia uh, may have meant something originally, but as it's used now, it doesn't mean anything except uh, well, in our own slang, whoopee. It's a, an exclamation of nonsensical delight. And it was Dante in the Paradiso who described the song of the angels as the laughter of the universe. And this sense of nonsense as the theme of the divine activity comes out also very strongly in the book of Job. I always think that the book of Job is the most profound book in the whole Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, because here is the problem of the man, the righteous man, who has suffered, and uh, all his friends try to rationalize it and say, well, you must have suffered because uh, you really had a secret sin after all and deserve the punishment of God or because uh, rationalize it somehow. And when they have their say, the Lord God appears on the scene and says, who is this that darkeneth counsel with words without knowledge? And then proceeds to ask Job and his friends a series of absolutely unanswerable conundrums pointing out all the apparent irrationality and nonsense of his creation. Why, for example, he said, do I send rain upon the desert where no man is? Most commentators on the book of Job end with the remark that, well, this poses the problem of suffering and the problem of evil, but doesn't really answer it. And yet in the end himself, Job seems to be satisfied. Uh, he somehow surrenders to the apparent unreasonableness of the Lord God. And this is not, I think, because Job is beaten down, and that, he, that he's unduly impressed with the royal, monarchical, and paternalistic authority of the deity, and doesn't dare to answer back. He realizes that somehow these very questions are the answer. I think of all the commentators on the book of Job, the person who came closest to this point was old G.K. Chesterton. He once made the glorious remark that it is one thing to look with amazement at a gorgon or a griffin, a creature who doesn't exist, but quite another thing to look at a, pot a hippopotamus, a creature who does exist and looks as if he doesn't. In other words, that all these, this strange world with its weird forms, like hippopotami. And when you look at them from a certain point of view, stones and trees and water and clouds and stars, when you look at them from a certain point of view and don't take them for granted, they're as weird as any hippopotamus or any imagination of fabulous beasts of gorgons and griffins and things like that. They are just plain improbable. And it is in this sense, I think, that they are the Alleluia, as it were, the nonsense song. Why do we love nonsense? Why do we love Lewis Carroll with his "'Twas brillig and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave, all mimsy with the borough groves and the momraths outgrave? Why is it that um, all those old English songs are full of Faldy riddle Ido and hey nonny nonny and all those babbling choruses. Why is it that when uh, we get 
pep with jazz. We just go booty, 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 boo, and so on, and enjoy ourselves swinging it. It is this participation in the essential, glorious nonsense that is at the heart of the world, that isn't going anywhere, that is a dance. But it seems that only in moments of unusual insight and illumination that we get the point of this and find that thus the true meaning of life is no meaning that its purpose is no purpose and that its sense is nonsense. But still, we want to use about it the word significant. Significant nonsense? Yes, nonsense that is not just chaos, that is not just blathering balderdash, but that has in it rhythm, fascinating complexity, a kind of artistry. It is in this kind of meaninglessness that we get the profoundest meaning. It's really a very unorthodox and unacademic thing to do, to start a discussion with a group of psychologists on the subject of metaphysics. But we have to do that. Because a lot of people say that their approach to life is scientific as distinct from metaphysical and that metaphysics is bosh anyway. But everybody, by virtue of being a human being, is willy-nilly a metaphysician. That is to say, everybody starts from certain fundamental assumptions as to what is the good life, what he wants, what are his, uh, shall we say, axioms for living. And I find that psychologists tend to be blind to these fundamental assumptions. Maybe it's truer of psychiatrists than it is of psychologists, but uh, <coughs> they tend to feel that they are scientists. They're rather bending over backwards to have a scientific status because that, of course, is fashionable in our age. But you know, it's so amusing that when, say, let's take psychoanalysis, for example, as pointed out to many philosophers, that their philosophical ideas are capable of being shown to have a psychoanalytic reference. For example, John Wisdom wrote a book about the philosophy of Berkeley, in which he attributed a great deal of his point of view to his experiences in toilet training as a child. <coughs> The philosopher is very grateful to the, the psychoanalyst for revealing to him his unconscious and its emotional contents. But the psychoanalyst must in turn await a revelation from the philosopher as to his philosophical unconscious and the unexamined assumptions which lie in it. So, if I may start by insulting your intelligence, with what is called the most elementary lesson. The thing that we should have learned before we learned one, two, three, and ABC, that somehow was overlooked. Now, this lesson is quite simply this, that any experience that we have through our senses, whether of sound or of light or of touch, is a vibration. And a vibration has two aspects, one called on and the other called off. Vibration is, seems to be propagated in waves and every wave system has crests and it has troughs. And so life is a system of now you see it, now you don't. And these two aspects always go together. For example, sound is not pure sound. It is a rapid alternation of sound and silence. And that's simply the way things are. Only you must remember that the crest and the trough of a wave are inseparable. Nobody ever saw crests without troughs or troughs without crests. Just as you don't encounter in life people 
with fronts but no backs. Just as you don't encounter a coin that has a heads but no tails. And although the heads and the tails, the fronts and the backs, the positives and the negatives are different, they're at the same time one. And one has to get used fundamentally to the notion that different things can be inseparable. That what is explicitly two can at the same time be implicitly one. If you forget that, very funny things happen. If therefore we forget, you see, that black and white are inseparable and that existence is constituted equivalently by being and non-being, then we get scared. And we have to play a game called, uh-oh, black might win. And once we get into the fear that black, the negative side, might win, we are compelled to play the game, but white must win. And from that start all our troubles. Because you see, the human awareness is a very odd mechanism. I don't think mechanism is quite the right word, but it'll do for the moment. That is to say, we have as a species specialized in a certain kind of awareness, which we call conscious attention. And by this, we have the faculty of examining the details of life very closely. We can restrict our gaze, and it corresponds somewhat to the peripheral field, I mean, the, the central field of vision in the eyes. We have central vision, we have peripheral vision. Central vision is that which we use for reading, for all sorts of close work. And it's like using a spotlight, whereas peripheral vision is more like using a floodlight. Now, civilization and civilized human beings for maybe 5,000 years, maybe much longer, have learned to specialize in concentrated attention. Even if a person's attention span is short, he is, as it were, wavering his spotlight over many fields. The price which we pay for specialization in conscious attention is ignorance of everything outside its field. I would rather say ignorance than ignorance. Because if you concentrate on a figure, <coughs> you tend to ignore the background. You tend, therefore, to see the world in a disintegrated aspect. You take separate things and events seriously, imagining that these really do exist, when actually they have the same kind of existence as an individual's interpretation of the Rorschach plot. They're what you make out of it. In fact, our physical world is a system of inseparable differences. Everything exists with everything else. But we contrive not to notice that, because what we notice is what is noteworthy. And we notice it in terms of notation. Numbers, words, images. What is notable, noteworthy, notated, noticed is what appears to us to be significant and the rest is ignored as insignificant. And as a result of that, we select from the total input that goes to our senses only a very small fraction. And this causes us to believe that we are separate beings, isolated by the boundary of the epidermis from the rest of the world. You see, this is also the mechanism involved in not noticing that black and white go together. Not noticing that every inside has an outside that the inside, what's inside, goes on inside your skin 
is inseparable from what goes on outside your skin. You see that, uh, for example, in the science of ecology, one learns that a human being is not an organism in an environment, but is an organism hyphen environment. That is to say, a unified field of behavior. If you describe carefully the behavior of any organism, you cannot do so without at the same time describing the behavior of the environment. And by that you know that you've got a new entity of study. You are describing the behavior of a unified field. But you must be very careful indeed not to fall into old Newtonian assumptions about the billiard ball nature of the universe. The organism is not the puppet of the environment, being pushed around by it. Nor, on the other hand, is the environment the puppet of the organism, being pushed around by the organism. The relationship between them is, to use John Dewey's word, transactional. The transaction being a situation like buying and selling, in which there is no buying unless somebody sells and no selling unless somebody buys. So that fundamental relationship between ourselves and the world, which is in an old-fashioned way by people such as Skinner, who have, not, who have not updated his philosophy, interpreted in terms of Newtonian mechanics. He interprets the organism as something determined by the total environment. He doesn't see that in a more modern way of talking about it. We're simply describing a unified field of behavior, which is nothing more than what any mystic ever said. That's a dirty word uh, in the modern academic scientific environment. But um, if a mystic is one who is sensibly or even sensuously aware of his inseparability as an individual from the total existing universe. He is simply a person who has become sensible, aware through his senses of the way ecologists see the world. So when I'm in academic circles, I don't talk about mystical experience. I talk about ecological awareness. Sensitive. And uh, so the next aspect of our metaphysical introduction must be about games. You know, I think there are really four questions that all philosophers have discussed from the beginning of recorded time. First is who started it? The second is are we going to make it? The third is where are we going to put it? And the fourth is who's going to clean up? When you think these over, it poses a fifth question. Is it serious? And that's the one I want to discuss. Is existence serious? Like you say to doctor, um, after he's looked at your x-ray picture, is it serious? What does that mean? It means uh, am I in danger of not continuing to survive? The question is, ought I to continue to survive? In other words, must I survive? If life is serious, then of course I must survive. If it is not serious, it really doesn't matter whether I do or I don't. Now, in Western culture, it is practically a basic assumption that existence is serious. This is particular, particularly true among people who call themselves existentialists. When they talk about a person who exists authentically, they mean that he takes his life seriously and other people's lives seriously. But the poet and uh, essayist G.K. Chesterton once observed that the angels fly because they take themselves lightly. And if I may venture into mythology, 
if the angels take themselves lightly, how much more so the Lord of the angels? <laughs> but you see, we have been brought up in a mythological context where the Lord God definitely does take himself seriously and is indeed the serious person. So that when we go into church, laughter is discouraged in the same way as it's discouraged in court. This is a serious matter and everybody has to have the right expression on their faces. Because this is the great, great authority figure. This is Grandpa. This is uh, blah, 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 all your kids, you know. And we don't realize that he has a twinkle in his eye. But the basis of it all is this then. If we say you must survive or I must survive, life is earnest and I've got to go on, then your life is a drag and not a game. Now it's my contention, my personal opinion, this is my basic metaphysical axiom, shall we put it that way, that existence, the physical universe, is basically playful. There is no necessity for it whatsoever. It isn't going anywhere. That is to say, it doesn't have some destination that it ought to arrive at. But, but it is best understood by analogy with music. Because music, as an art form, is essentially playful. We say you play the piano. You don't work the piano. Why? Music differs from, say, travel. When you travel, you are trying to get somewhere. And of course, we, because being a very compulsive and purposive culture, are busy getting everywhere faster and faster and faster till we eliminate the distance between places. I mean, with the modern jet travel, you can arrive almost instantaneously. <clears throat> what happens as a result of that is that the two ends of your journey become the same place. So you eliminate the distance and you eliminate the journey. Because the fun of the journey is to travel, not to obliterate travel. So then, in music, though, one doesn't make the end of a composition the point of the, comp of the composition. If that were so, the best conductors would be those who played fastest. <laughs> and there would be composers who wrote only finales. <laughs> People go to concert just to hear one crashing chord, because that's the end. <laughs> Same way in dancing. You don't aim at a particular spot in the room. That's where you should arrive. The whole point of the dancing is the dance. Now, but we don't see that as uh, something brought by our education into our everyday conduct. We've got a system of schooling which gives a completely different impression. It's all graded. And what we do is we put the child into the corridor of this grade system with a kind of, come on, kitty, kitty, kitty. And yeah, you go to kindergarten, you know. And that's a great thing because when you finish that, you'll get into first grade. And then come on, first grade leads to second grade and so on. And then you get out of grade school, you've got high school and it's revving up, the thing is coming. Then you're gonna to go to college and by Jove, then you get into graduate school. And when you're through with graduate school, you go out to join the world. And then you get into some racket where you're selling insurance and they've got that quota to make and you're going to make that and all the time the thing is coming it's coming it's coming that great thing the, the success you're working for then when you wake up one day about 40 years old you say my god i've arrived <laughs> i'm there and you don't feel very different from what you always felt and there's a slight letdown because you feel there's a hoax and there was a hoax a dreadful hoax. They made you miss everything by expectation. Look at the people who live to retire and put those savings away. 
And then when they're 65, they don't have any energy left, they're more or less impotent, and uh, they go and rot in an old people's, senior citizens' community. <laughs> because we've simply cheated ourselves the whole way down the line. <coughs> We thought of life by analogy with a journey, with a pilgrimage, which had a serious purpose at the end. The thing was to get to that end, success or whatever it is, or maybe heaven after you're dead. But we missed the point the whole way along. It was a musical thing and you were supposed to sing or to dance while the music was being played. But you had to do that thing. You didn't let it happen. And so, for this, in this way, the human being sometimes becomes an organism for self-frustration. Let's take uh, Kozhebsky called man a time binder. That means that he's the animal peculiarly aware of the time sequence. And as a result of this, is able to do some very remarkable things. He can predict. He studies what's happened in the past, and he says the chances are so-and-so of that happening again. So he predicts. Now, this is very useful to be able to predict, because that has survival value. But at the same time, it creates anxiety. You pay for this increased survival ability involved in prediction by knowing that in the end you won't succeed. They're all going to fall apart by one way or another. It might happen tomorrow, it might happen 50 years from now, but it all comes apart in the end. And people get worried about that, they get anxious. So what they gained on the roundabout, they lost on the swings. So then, if you see, on the other hand, that existence, this is, as I said, my basic metaphysical assumption, which I won't conceal from you, that existence is musical in nature. That is to say that it is not serious. It is the play of all kinds of patterns. We can look upon different creatures as we look at different games, as we look at chess, checkers, backgammon, tennis, with the tree game, the beetle game, the grass game, or you can look at them as you look at different styles of music, mazurkas, waltzes, uh, sonata, etc., etc., all down the line. There are all these different things doing their stuff. And they're going to do, 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 you know, in different rhythms. And we're doing that. If you were in a flying saucer from Mars or somewhere and you came and looked, trying to make out what was living on this world, from about 10,000 feet at night, or early morning, you would see these great ganglia with tentacles going out all over the place. And early in the morning, you see little uh, blobs of luminous particles going into the middle of them. See? And then uh, in the late afternoon or early evening, it would spit them all out again. And they say, well, this thing, this thing breathes. And it does it in a special rhythm. It goes in and out, in and out, in and out once every 24 hours. But then it rests a day and doesn't spit so much. It spits in a different way. That's a kind of irregularity. And then it starts spitting all over again the same way. But I say that's very interesting. That's the kind of thing we, we have. See? This is something that goes this way. <laughs> now existence, you see, is something that is spontaneous. The Chinese word for nature, zhuan, uh, means that which happens of itself. Your hair grows by itself. Your heart beats by itself. You breathe pretty much by itself. Your glands secrete their essences by themselves. You don't have voluntary control over these things. So we say it happens spontaneously. So when you go to sleep and you try to go to sleep, you interfere with the spontaneous process of going to sleep. Try to breathe, you know, real hard and you find you get balled up in your breathing. So, uh, if, you, if you're going to be human, you just have to trust yourself to have bowel movements and go to sleep and digest your food 
Uh, of course, if something goes seriously wrong and you need a surgeon, that's another matter. But by and large, uh, the healthy human being uh, uh, doesn't, right from the start of life, need surgical interference. And he lets it happen by, by itself. So, so with the whole picture, that is fundamental. You've got to let go and let it happen. Because if you don't, you're going to be all clutched up. You're going to be constantly trying to do what can happen healthily only if you don't try. And when people, uh, when you think a bit what people really want to do with their time, what do they do when they're not being pushed around and somebody's telling them what to do? They like to go, uh, they like to make rhythms. They listen to music, they dance, they sing, or they do something of a rhythmic nature, playing cards or bowling, raising their elbows. <laughs> Everybody wants to spend their time swinging. <laughs> and that's, that's the nature of this whole thing we're in, you see, it likes to swing. That's why it does it. Well now, what I want to do is have a mutual brain picking session and uh, I'm going to start the ball rolling by saying why I as a philosopher am interested in many things that you are all probably interested in professionally. Basically what we're going to talk about I suppose is the problem of control as exemplified in the ancient Latin question, quis custodia custodies ipsos? Who guards the guards? Now, we, we know that we're living in an age when uh, there's been an enormous proliferation of techniques for subjecting every kind of natural process outside the human skin and now increasingly inside the human skin to some form of rational control. And as we succeed in doing this, it also becomes apparent that we've, we're failing that the process becomes of such a high degree of complexity that we begin to feel that we're standing in our own way. That uh, everybody complains. The state of affairs in the modern world, in the technological world, is so complicated that nobody can understand it. Nobody really knows what to do. That, for example, you want to run a small business and you find you run into such enormous legal hassles that you need so many secretaries to do the paperwork that you can hardly do the business that you're trying to run a hospital but that you have to spend so much time making records and writing things down on paper that you don't have much time to practice medicine that you're trying to run a university and the requirements the recording, the in endless red tape of the registrar's office and the administration building is such that the actual work of research and teaching is seriously hampered. So the individual increasingly feels himself obstructed by his own cautiousness. This is basically what it is. Now, uh, to explain myself, first of all, because most of you are strangers to me, I am a philosopher who has for many years been interested in the mutual fructification of Eastern cultures and Western cultures, studying Oriental ideas, uh, not in the spirit of saying to the West, you ought to be converted to Oriental ideas, but in the spirit of saying, you don't understand the basic assumptions of your own culture if your own culture is the only culture you know. 
Everybody operates on certain basic assumptions, but very few people know what they are. You can say, I very often encounter the sort of character who's an American businessman. And he says, well, I'm a practical businessman. I, have got, I believe in getting results and things done. And all this thinking and highfalutin logic and nonsense is of no concern to me. Now, I know that the practical basic assumptions, the metaphysics of that man, can be defined as pragmatism, as a school of philosophy. But it's bad pragmatism because he's never thought it through. And so uh, it's very difficult, you see, to get down to what are your basic assumptions. What do you mean by the good life? What do you mean by consistency? What do you mean by rationality? The only way of finding out what you mean by these things is by contrasting the way you look at something by the way it's looked at in another culture. And therefore we have to find cultures which are in some ways as sophisticated as our own, but as different from our own as possible. And of course for this purpose I always thought that the, the Chinese were optimal and the Indians, the East Indians. And that by studying the ideas of these people, by studying their life goals, we could become more aware of our own. It's the old principle of triangulation. You don't uh, establish the situation of a particular object unless you observe it from two particular different points of view and thereby calculate its actual distance from you. So by looking at what we are pleased to call reality, the physical world, from the basic standpoints of different cultures, uh, I think we're in a better position to know where we are than if we only have one single line of sight. And therefore, this has been my interest and my background. And arising out of this, there has come a further question, which I would call the problems of human ecology. Uh, how is man to be best related to his environment, especially in circumstances where we are in possession of an extremely powerful technology and have therefore the capacity to change our environment uh, far more than anyone else has ever been able to do so. Are we going to end up not by civilizing the world but by Los Angelizing it? In other words, are we going to foul our own nest as a result of technology? But all this gets down to the basic question is Really, what are you going to do if you're God? If, in other words, you find yourself in charge of the world through technological powers, and instead of leaving evolution to what we used to call in the 19th century the blind processes of nature, that was begging the question to call them blind, but in any, at any rate, we say we're not going to leave evolution anymore to the blind forces of nature, but now we're going to direct it ourselves. Because we are increasingly developing, say, control over genetic systems, control over the nervous system, control over all kinds of systems. Uh, then, simply, what do you want to do with it? But most people don't know what they want and have never even seriously confronted the question of what they want. You ask uh, a group of students to sit down and write a solid paper of 20 pages on what is your idea of heaven? What would you really like to happen if you could make it happen? And that's the first thing that starts people really thinking because you soon realize that a lot of the things you think you would want are not things you want at all. Supposing, just for the sake of illustration, you had the power to dream every night any dream you wanted to dream. And you could, of course, arrange for one night of dreams to be uh, 75 years of subjective time, or any number of years of subjective time. What would you do? Well, of course, you'd start out by fulfilling every wish. You would have routes and orgies and uh, uh, 
all the most magnificent food and uh, uh, sexual partners and everything you could possibly imagine in that direction. When you got tired of that, after several nights, you would switch a bit and you'd soon find yourself involved in adventures and uh, contemplating great works of art, fantastic mathematical conceptions. You would soon be rescuing princesses from dragons and all sorts of things like that. And then one night you'd say, now look, tonight what we're going to do is we're going to forget this dream is a dream. And we've got to be really uh, shocked. And uh, when you woke up from that one, you'd say, ooh, wasn't that an adventure? Then you'd think more and more far out ways to get involved and let go of control. Knowing that you'd always come back to center in the end. But while you were involved in the dream, you wouldn't know you'd come, you were going to come back to center, be in control. And so eventually you'd be dreaming a dream in which you found yourselves all sitting around in this room, listening to me talking, all involved with the particular life problems which you have. And maybe that's what you're doing. <laughs> but here's the difficulty, you see. The difficulty of control. Are you wise enough to play at being God? And to understand what that question means, we've got to go back to metaphysical assumptions underlying Western common sense. And whether you are a Jew or a Christian or an agnostic or an atheist, you are not uninfluenced by the whole tradition of Western culture, the models of the universe which it has employed, which influence our very language, the structure of our thought, the very constitution of logic. which are going into, say, computers. The Western model of the universe is political and engineering or architectural. It is natural for a child to ask its mother, how was I made? It would be inconceivable for a Chinese child to ask, how was I made? It might ask, how was I grown, or how did I grow, but not how was I made, as if I were an artifact, something put together, something which is a construct. But all Western thought is based on the idea that the universe is a construct. And even when we got rid of the idea of the constructor, the personal God, uh, we continued to think of the world in terms of the machine, in terms, say, of Newtonian mechanics, and later in terms of what we call quantum mechanics, although I find it rather difficult to understand how quantum theory is in any sense mechanics. It's, it's much more like organics, which is to me a different concept. However, that may be. It has percolated, you see, into the roots of our common sense that the world is a construct, is an artifact. And therefore, as one understands the operations of the machine by analysis of its parts, by separating them into their original bits, we have bitted the cosmos and see everything going on in terms of bits, bits of information, and have found that this is extremely fruitful in enabling us to control what's happening. After all, the whole of Western technology is the result of bidding. Let's suppose, you know, you want to eat a chicken. You can't eat the whole chicken at once. You have to bite it. You have to reduce it to bits. But you don't get a cut-up fryer out of an egg. It doesn't come that way. So what has happened is this. That we don't know the origins of all this. It's maybe go back thousands of years. The way we develop the art of thinking, which is essentially calculus, is this. The universe as it comes in nature, the physical universe, is something like a Rorschach plot. 
It's all wiggles. Uh, we who live in cities are not really used to this because we build everything in straight lines and rectangles and so on. Wherever you see this sort of thing, you know human beings have been around because they're always trying to straighten things out. <laughs> But nature itself, it's clouds, it's water, it's the outlines of continents, it's mountains, it's uh, uh, biological existences, and all of them wiggle. And wiggly things are to human consciousness a little bit of a nuisance. Because we want to figure it out. And it is as if, therefore, some ancient fisherman one day held up his net looked at the world through the net. He said, my, just think of that. There I can see the view. It's one, and that peak of that mountain is one, two, three, four, five, six holes across. And the base is one, two, three, four, five holes down. Now I've got its number. See? And so the lines of latitude and longitude, the lines of celestial and terrestrial, latitude and longitude. The whole idea of a matrix, of a uh, looking at things through graph, paper painted on, uh, printed on cellophane, is the basic idea of measurement. This is the way we calculate. We break down the wiggliness of the world into comprehensible, countable, geometrical units, and thereby figure it constructed in those terms and this is so successful up to a point that we can of course come to imagine that this is the way the physical world really is discrete discontinuous uh, full of points and in, in fact a mechanism but I want to just put into your mind the notion that this may be the prejudice of a certain personality type. You see, in, in the history of philosophy and poetry and art, we always find the interchange of two personality types, which I call prickles and goo. <laughs> the prickly people are um, advocates of intellectual porcupinism. Uh, they want a rigor. They want precise statistics. And they have a sudden clipped attitude in their voices. And you know this very well in academic circles, where there are people who are always edgy like that. And they accuse other people of being disgustingly vague and miasmic and mystical. But the vague, miasmic and mystical people accuse the prickly people of being mere skeletons with no flesh on their bones. And they say to you, you just rattle. You're not really a human being. You know the words, but you don't know the music. And so therefore, if you belong to the prickly type, you hope that the ultimate constituent of matter is particles. If you belong to the gooey type, you hope it's waves. If you are prickly, you're a classicist. And if you're gooey, you're a romanticist. And going back into medieval philosophy, if you're prickly, you're a nominalist. If you're gooey, you're a realist. And uh, so it goes. But we know very well that this natural universe is neither prickles nor goo exclusively. It's gooey prickles and prickly goo. And uh, you see, it all depends on your level of magnification. If you've got your magnification on something so that the focus is clear, you've got a prickly point of view. You've got structure, shape, clearly outlined, sharply defined. The little out of focus has got to go bleh. And you've got goo. But we're always playing with the two. Because it's like the question is, um, is the world basically stuff, like matter, or is it basically structure? Well, we find out, of course, today that in science we don't consider the idea of matter, of just of there being some sort of stuff. Because supposing you wanted to describe stuff, in what terms would you describe it? You always have to describe it in terms of structure. Something countable, something that can be designated as a pattern. 
so we never get to any basic stuff. It seems to me that this way of thinking is based on a form of consciousness which we could best call scanning. The capacity to divide experiences into bits is somehow related to a physical facility which corresponds to sweeping a radar beam or a spotlight over the environment. The advantage of the spotlight is it gives you intensely concentrated light on restricted areas. A floodlight, by comparison, has less intensity. But if you examine, say, this room we're in total darkness, and you use the spotlight, very thin beam, and you scan the room with it, you would have to retain in memory all the areas over which it passed, and then by an additive process, you would make out the contours of the room. And it seems to me that this is something in which civilized man, both in the East and in the West, has specialized. In a, in a, a method of paying attention to things which we call noticing. And therefore it's highly selective, it picks out, it's punctive, it picks out features in the environment which we say are noteworthy and which we therefore register with a notation be it the notation of words, the notation of numbers, or such a notation, say, as uh, algebra or music. So that we notice those things, only those things, for which we have notation. When a child, very often a child, uh, will point at something, say to its parents, what's that? And they're not clear what the child is pointing to. The child has pointed to something which we consider is not a thing. The child has pointed to an area, say, of funny pattern on a dirty wall and has noticed a figure on it. But the child doesn't have a word for it and says, what's that? And the adult says, oh, that's just a mess. Because that doesn't count for us as a thing. So you come through this to the understanding. What do you mean by a thing? It's very fascinating to ask children. What do you mean by a thing? And they don't know. Because it's one of the unexamined suppositions of the culture. What do you mean by an event? Well, everybody knows what an event is, but nobody can say. Because a thing is a think. It's a unit of thought, like an inch is a unit of measurement. And so we thing the world, that is to say, in order to measure a curve, you have to reduce it to point instants and apply the calculus so in exactly the same way in order to discuss or talk about the universe you have to reduce it to things but each thing or think is as it were one grasp of that spotlight going like this you see so we reduce the infinite wiggliness of the world to grasps or bits, we're getting back to biting, you see, the idea of the teeth, to grasps of thought. And so we thereby describe the world in terms of things just as that fisherman could describe his view by the number of net hole over, through which the view was showing. And this has been the immensely and apparently successful enterprise of all technological culture, superbly emphasized by ourselves. The Western model of the universe 
is political and engineering or architectural. And therefore, as one understands the operations of the machine by analysis of its parts, by separating them into their original bits, we have bitted the cosmos and see everything going on in terms of bits, bits of information, and have found that this is extremely fruitful in enabling us to control what's happening. After all, the whole of Western technology is the result of bidding. And so we thing the world, that is to say, in order to measure a curve, you have to reduce it to point instants and apply the calculus so in exactly the same way in order to discuss or talk about the universe you have to reduce it to things but each thing or think is as it were one grasp of that spotlight going like this you see so we reduce the infinite wiggliness of the world to grasps or bits we're getting back to biting you see the idea of the teeth to grasps of thought and so we thereby describe the world in terms of things just as that fisherman could describe his view by the number of net hole over through which the view was showing But the problem that arises is, is this. First of all, very obviously, everybody knows, I hardly need to mention it. Uh, go to the science of medicine. You get a specialist who really understands the function of the gallbladder. And he studied gallbladders, gallbladders, gallbladders ad infinitum. And he really thinks he knows all about it. But whenever he looks at a human being, he sees him in terms of gallbladder. And so if he operates on the gallbladder, he may do so very knowledgeably about that particular area of the organism. But he does not foresee the unpredictable effects of this operation in other connected areas because the human being's gallbladder is not a thing in the same way as the, um, a spark plug in a car can be extracted and a new one replaced. Because the system isn't the same. There is a fundamental difference between a mechanism and an organism which can be described operationally. Mechanism is assembled. You add this bit to that bit to that bit to that bit. But an organism grows. That is to say, when you watch in a microscope uh, a solution in which crystals are forming, you don't see this thing of little bits coming in, coming in, coming in, joining each other and finally making up a shape. You see a solution where, well, it's like when you watch a photographic plate developing. But suddenly, all, the whole area which you're watching seems to organize itself to develop, to make sense. Moving from the relatively simple and gooey to the relatively structured and prickly. But not by addition. So then, if we are trying to control and understand the world through conscious attention, which is a scanning system, which takes in everything bit, 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 bit. What we're going to run into is that if that's the only method we rely on, everything is going to appear increasingly too complicated to manage. So that you get, for example, uh, let's take uh, the problem of um, the electronic industry. The catalogs of products that are being produced over the world by the electronic industry. Who has read all the catalogs? How do you know uh, where, where you've got a, 
something you're working on, whether it's patented or not, who else has taken out a patent? Has anybody had time to read all the catalogs? Well, nobody has. They're just voluminous. And it's exactly the same in almost any other field. There's an information explosion like a population explosion. How on earth are you going to scan all that information? Yes, of course you can get computers to help you in this direction. But by Parkinson's law, uh, the sooner, uh, sooner you become more efficient in doing this, uh, the more the thing is going to develop so that you will have to have more efficient computers still to assimilate all the information. You'll be ahead, but uh, only for a short time. So you see, there's this problem of uh, the, the sort of competition of consciousness, of its how fast can you go? Do 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 and keep track of it, you see. And say, I'm a I've got a good memory, I can keep track of that. And you say to you, I bet you you can't. I'll go more complicated than you. You let musicians do this, like drummers, you know. And they get things going and they start and they and so long as they count, and lots of musicians do count, it's crazy. But they do. And they count, 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 and they out complicate each other to the point where you can't retain it any longer in memory. So you say, okay, if I, if I can't retain it, we've got this gadget here that can. And we've got these um, marvelous mechanical memories and they will retain it. They'll go much more fancy. They'll go this duty, duty, duty at a colossal speed like that, you see. But it's the same old problem. Because you've got something that can outdo that. So we end up asking, uh, yeah, but supposing there were some other way of understanding things. Let's go back from the spotlight to the floodlight, to the extraordinary capacity of the human nervous system to comprehend situations instantaneously without analysis, that is to say without verbal or numerical symbolism of the situation in order to understand it. I hope you understand what I mean. Okay. We, we do do that. We have this curious ability of pattern recognition, which uh, the me mechanical systems have only in a very primitive way. Xerox have put out a machine which recognizes figures uh, written in almost anyone's handwriting, provided their handwriting is fairly uh, grade school and normal. But a computer has a terrible time trying to recognize the letter A when it's printed in, say, sans serif, Gothic, uh, longhand, uh, or whatever kind of A you may write. The human recognizes instantly this pattern but the computer is still at a disadvantage here. It seems to lack a kind of uh, capacity I would call field organization, because it's all punctive, it's digital. It, uh, it's like a newspaper photograph, you know, which when you look at it under a microscope is all dots. Now, so the, the, problem, the problem is this. In developing technology, are we leaving out of consideration our strongest suit, which is the brain itself? See, we are in a situation where the brain is still uh, not really worked out by even the most competent neurologists. It puzzles them. They can't uh, give a model of the brain in numerical or verbal language. Now you are that, you see. You are this thing. You yourself are this thing which you yourself can't figure out. In the same way that I cannot touch the tip of this finger with the tip of this finger. I can't bite my own teeth. But 
I, who is attempting to touch the tip of this finger with this finger, am, by the sheer complexity of my structure, far more evolved than any system which I can imagine. This is, in a way, uh, slightly akin to the Gödel theorem, that um, you can't have a, a system of, uh, say, a logic which defines its own axioms. The axioms of any given system must always be defined in terms of a higher system. All right, so you are the most complex thing that has yet been encountered in the cosmos. And you can't figure you out. Now, you, suppose we're going to try to do that. And become, as it were, completely transparent to ourselves so that we can entirely understand the organization or the mechanics of our own brains. What happens when we do that? Well, you're in the you're back in the situation of God. When you're God, what are you going to do? When you're God, you know what you're going to do. You're going to say to yourself, "Man, get lost," <laughs> because what you want is a surprise. And when you figured everything out, there won't be any surprises. You'll be completely bored. But on the other hand. A, a person, I would say, who is um, really functioning completely is basically a person who trusts his own brains. And permits his brain to operate at a more optimal level. In other words, he knows how to think things out, but he makes his best discoveries without thinking. In other words, you all know very well the processes of um, creative invention. You've got a problem, you think it over, and you can't find out any answer to it because the digital system of thinking is too simple, too clumsy to deal with it. It's more complex. There are more variables than can be kept in, in mind at one time. So you say, I'll sleep on it. Or you go to a, the Institute of Advanced Studies at Princeton, uh, of Behavioral Sciences at Stanford, where they pay you to goof off, which is highly an excellent idea. And you moon around, and you've got a blackboard, and you look out of the window and pick your nose, and so on. And your brain eventually hands you the solution to the problem. And you immediately, because you have technical knowledge, you recognize that's a solution. But then, naturally, you go back and check it. And you work the bit-by-bit the -bit form of thinking on it and see, now, does it come out in those terms? And if it does, everybody will agree with you. Yes, that's the answer. But if it doesn't come out in those terms, they won't agree with you. Because you haven't subjected it to the socially acceptable, traditional form of anal an analyzing knowledge. But here's the problem. It takes an awful long time to check these things out. It takes an awful long time to arrive at the solution which you've got, like that, by a purely calculated process. Most of the situations of life are such that they don't wait for us to make up our minds. So that an enormous amount of carefully worked out scientific knowledge is trivial. all very well, very finely worked out, but much too late. Because life presents you, life comes at you from all sides, all over everywhere at once. And the only thing you've got to deal with that is the thing inside here in the skull. But it so happened that in the 18th century, Western thought began to change they became increasingly doubtful as to whether there was a maker, whether there was a God, but they continued to look upon the creation as an artifact, as a machine. And by the time of Newton, people were explaining the world in terms of mechanism. And we are still under the influence of that idea 
because after all in things like Life magazine and so on, when they give you an article on human physiology, they usually make drawings which show the human being as a kind of mechanism, as a sort of factory. And they show how the peristaltic action carries the food in and how it's processed by this organ and that organ. as just as if uh, a certain product is fed into a factory, cow at one end, and it comes out canned corned beef at the other. Just in such a way, the human is illustrated. And so too, in uh, some kinds of rather degraded medicine that is now practiced, when you go to the hospital for a medical examination, you are treated as a machine. They process you. You're not a person. You're put in a wheelchair immediately. Even if you were perfectly healthy and could walk, nevertheless, they have to have you in this wheelchair. And they put you through a process. And the heart specialist looks only at your heart because he can't understand anything else. The otorhinolaryngologist, which means an ear, nose, and throat man, looks at that section of you and he doesn't know about anything else. And maybe a psychiatrist takes a look at you and uh, goodness knows what happens there and so on and so on. Everybody looks at you from their specialized point of view as if they were a bunch of mechanics examining your automobile. Because as I said last night, but we, we just asked for this because most of the, us consider ourselves as chauffeurs inside our bodies, which we own in the same way as you own a car. And when it goes wrong, you take it to the mechanic to fix it. You don't really identify with your body, just as you don't really identify with your car. So here is this whole theory of nature, which has grown up in the West as an artifact, something made. Now let me take a second theory of nature. This is an Indian theory. East Indian. Nature not as an artifact, but as drama. Basic to all Hindu thought is the idea that the world is Maya. That is a Sanskrit word which means many things. It means magic, illusion, art, play. All the world's a stage. And in the Hindu idea, there is the ultimate reality of the universe is the self, which they call Brahman or Atman. That's what there is. The self, universal, eternal, boundless, indescribable. And everything that happens, happens on the self. Like you say, it's on me. The drinks tonight are on me. Uh, or like we say, uh, when you hear the radio, it's on the speaker. You see, everything you hear on the radio, flutes, drums, human voices, traffic noises, any imaginable sound, all those sounds are vibrations of the diaphragm in the speaker. But the radio doesn't tell you that. The announcer doesn't come on and say every morning, Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is KQED. The following sounds that you are going to hear are vibrations of your, the diaphragm in your speaker. And they're not really uh, human voices or musical instruments, but just that. They never let you in on that. And in exactly the same way, the universe doesn't let you in on the truth that all sense experiences are vibrations of the self. Not just your self, but the self. And all of us share this self in common because it is pretending to be all of us. Brahman, the ultimate principle, plays hide and seek eternally. And he does it for unspeakably long periods of time. The Hindus measure time in what is called a kalpa. K-A-L-P-A. -A. That's 4,320,000 years. Don't take this seriously. It's not meant to be taken literally. But just for an unspeakably long time, the Brahman, the self, pretends that it's lost. 
and is us. And all our adventures and all our troubles and all our agonies and tragedies, it gets mixed up in it. Then after the period of 4,320,000 years has elapsed, there is a catastrophe. The universe is destroyed in fire. And after that, the Brahman wakes up and says, well, good, crazy, what, a, what an adventure that was. He wipes the sweat off his brow and says, Whew, let's rest a while. So for another 4,320,000 years, the divine self rests and knows who it is. It's me. Then it says, well, this is rather boring. Let's get going again. Let's get mixed up. And it does it in a very strange way because uh, the way the Hindus time it, the first period of getting mixed up, getting lost, is beautiful. That's the longest period. Everything's right. It's just life is glorious. Then it has the next period in which things get a little wonky. Something is vaguely out of order. That doesn't last so long. Then the next period, the third, is when good and evil are equally balanced. And that's still not so long. Finally comes the shortest period when everything bad triumphs and the whole thing blows up and we begin all over again. We're supposed to be living in that now. It's what's called the Kali Yuga. The age of darkness. And it began on Friday, February the 23rd 3,123 B.C. And it has 5,000 years to run. But as it goes on, time gets faster, so don't worry. <laughs> so you see, that's a theory of nature as a drama. It's a play. Now there's a third theory of nature, which is Chinese. This is very interesting. The Chinese word for nature, they call zhira. And this expression means of itself so. What happens of itself. or we might say spontaneity. It almost means automatic, because automatic is what is self-moving. Only, we associate the word automatic with machinery. But Ziran, what is of so of itself, is associated in the Chinese mind, not with machinery, but with biology. Your hair grows by itself. You don't have to think how to grow it. Your heart beats by itself. You don't have to make up your mind how to beat it. That's what they mean by nature. The poem says, sitting quietly, doing nothing, spring comes and grass grows of itself. So their principle of nature is called the Tao. P-A-O, pronounced Dao in the Mandarin dialect, Tao in the Shanghai dialect, To in the Cantonese dialect. Take your choice. Dao means the course of nature. And Lao Tzu, who was a philosopher who lived a little later than 400 B.C., wrote a book about the Tao and he said the Tao which can be spoken is not the eternal Tao you can't describe it he said the principle of the Tao is spontaneity he said the great Tao flows everywhere both to the left and to the right it loves and nourishes all things but does not lord it over them it accomplishes merits and lays no claim to So there is a very great difference between the Chinese idea of Tao as the informing principle of nature and the Judeo-Christian idea of God as nature's Lord and Master. Because the Tao does not act as a boss. 
in the Chinese philosophy of nature, nature has no boss. There is no principle that forces things to behave the way they do. It is a completely democratic theory of nature. Correspondingly, you see, most Westerners, whether they be Christians or non-Christians, don't trust nature. Of all things, nature is the thing least to be trusted. You must manage it. You must watch out for it. It will always go wrong if you don't watch out. You know, the goblins will get you if you don't watch out. So we're always feeling that you can't trust it. See, we are absolutely instilled with the idea of original sin. You can't trust nature because it comes out with weeds and insects. And above all, you can't trust human nature because if you don't hold a club over yourself, you go out and rape your grandmother. Now the Chinese would say, if you can't trust yourself, you can't trust anything. Because if you can't trust yourself, can you trust your mistrust of yourself? Is that well founded? See? You're, if you can't trust yourself, you are totally mixed up. You haven't a leg to stand on, you haven't a point of departure for anything. And in this respect, the Taoist philosophy and the Confucian philosophy are in agreement. In Confucius philosophy, the fundamental virtue of a human being is called Yang. Spelled J-E-N, for reasons best known to Chinese scholars. Uh, I don't know what they are, but it's pronounced Yang. And it's a character, Chinese character, that Confucius placed as the highest of all virtues, higher than righteousness, higher than benevolence, and it means approximately human heartedness. Now, Confucius once said that goody goodies are the thieves of virtue. Virtue in Chinese is the we Romanize it as T-E-H, de. And it means virtue not in the sense of moral propriety, but virtue in the sense of magic, as when we speak of the healing virtues of a certain plant. A man of true virtue is therefore a human-hearted man. And the meaning of this is that one should, above all, trust human nature in the full recognition that it's both good and bad, that it's both loving and selfish. Now, let me give an illustration of the wisdom of this. When people fight wars, uh, I trust them. If the reason for which they fight a war is to expropriate somebody else's possessions and women. Because they will fight a merciful war. They will not destroy the possessions and the women that they want to capture. They want to enjoy them. And that's a war based on simple, ordinary, everyday human greed. The most awful wars that are waged are the wars waged for moral principles. You are a lousy communist. You have a philosophy that is destructive to religion and to everything that we love and value and reverence and therefore we will exterminate you to the last man unless you surrender unconditionally. Such wars are ruthless beyond belief. We can blow up whole cities, wipe people out because we are not greedy. We are righteous. That is why the goody goodies are the thieves of virtue. If you are going to do something evil, 
do it for a plain, honest, selfish motive. Don't do it in the name of God. Because if you do, it turns you into a monster who is no longer human. A sadist, a pure destroyer. So an inflexibly righteous person is not human. And that is why in Chinese ideas of justice, a good judge is not somebody who abides by the book. Their idea of justice is, for God's sake, keep the case out of court. Let us have a consultation behind the scenes. And let's arrange a compromise. Because we know our opponent is a rascal. I know I am a rascal. And therefore there can be a mutual arrangement between thieves. So we summon our arm, we talk about it, we call the judge in, in an unofficial capacity. And the judge hums and haws, and if he's a good judge, he has a sense of what is called Li. I'm going to talk to you about another meaning of the word pronounced Li later on, but it's quite a different word. Li is justice, but you can't write it down. There is another word for justice or law in Chinese, zi. And this word represents in its Chinese character form a cauldron for cooking sacrifices and a knife. In the high and far off times of Chinese history, there was an emperor who when the people brought their sacrifices of meat and so on to be put in the cauldrons, he also scratched with a knife on the side of the cauldrons the laws of the state so that all the people could read them and understand what they were. But the sages who advised this emperor said that was a very bad thing to do because the moment people see the law written down they develop a litigious spirit that is to say they think out ways of wangling around it. And that's what we do all the time, don't we? The moment Congress passes a law, tax law especially, all the lawyers get together and they think they think they fill it full of holes. They say, well, it didn't define this and it didn't say that. And some of those Confucians wanted to put the language in order and to make all the words mean just so. But the Taoists laughed at them and said, if you define the words, with what words are you going to define the words that define the words? So they said, therefore, the emperor should not have written the laws down because a sense of justice is not something you can put in words. It's what our lawyers call equity. And you talk to any lawyer and he, in discussing various judges around town, he will say, well, Judge so-and-so is pretty much a stickler for the letter of the law. But on the other hand, Judge so-and-so has a sense of equity. He knows when the law, the letter of the law, just doesn't apply to this particular case. And he just has an innate sense of fair play. That's the man to be trusted as a judge. So this is what the Chinese mean by a judge who has the sense of Li, of real justice. It can't be written down, it can't be explained because every case is individual. But what such a man has fundamentally in his heart, he trusts the good and bad of human nature. Human beings are complex. We don't know ourselves at all, really. Consider your nervous system. Neurologists haven't even begun to figure it out. And yet all your conscious decisions are based on this thing that you don't understand. You're unbelievably more wise in your nature than you ever will be in your conscious thoughts. Because behind your conscious thoughts lies your nervous system. And if you say, well, my nervous system is unreliable, 
It is just a bunch of, of strange and weird biological chances that have got mixed up somehow. Then this very opinion that you're expressing, you see, is a function of that nervous system. So you're saying that you are a total hoax. You can't trust yourself at all. So that is a, 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 a set of game rules that don't lead anywhere. It's totally self-frustrating. So you see what the Chinese have developed here is a theory of nature. I said there are three theories. The Western mechanical theory, nature as an artifact, the Hindu dramatic theory, and the Chinese organic theory. Nature, human nature included, is an organism. And an organism is a system of orderly anarchy. There is no boss in it, but it gets along by being left alone and being allowed to do its stuff. That's what the Chinese Taoist philosophy calls Wu Wei, which means not doing nothing, but not interfering with the course of events, not acting against the grain. Now this is the time to introduce the second word, Li, in Chinese. The first Li meant justice. The second Li is a character which had the original meaning of the markings in jade, the grain in wood, the fiber in muscle. And it's usually translated reason or the principle of things. These are not very good translations. The best translation of Li is organic pattern. Now look here. When you look at the clouds, they aren't symmetrical. They don't form fours. They don't come along in cubes. But you know at once that they're not a mess. A dirty old ashtray full of junk may be a mess. The clouds don't look like that. When you look at the patterns of foam on water, they never make an artistic mistake. And they're not mess. They are wiggly, but in a way orderly, and it's difficult for us to describe that kind of order. Now take a look at yourselves. You're all wiggly. We think, you know, we are pretty ordinary because there are a lot of us that look approximately the same. So when we hear, see a human being, we think, well, that's pretty much in order and kind of regular and it's okay. We don't realize how wiggly we are. We're just like clouds, rocks, and stars. Uh, look at the way the stars are arranged. Do you criticize the way the stars are arranged? Would you like them to form fours? Would you like them to be uh, sort of set out like uh, needlepoint on the canvas of the skies. There was somebody in the 18th century, in the days when they built formal gardens and clipped hedges and made all the tulips stand together like soldiers, who criticized the stars for being irregularly arranged. But today, we don't feel that way. We love the way the stars are scattered. And they never make a mistake in their arrangement. What about mountain ranges? Do you criticize the valleys for being low? Praise the peaks for being high? You just say it's great, it's the way it is. Now that kind of order, the artist pays a tribute to it by painting a landscape. People, you know, in, in every national park, there's a place called Inspiration Point. And people go there and they say, oh, it's just like a picture. <laughs> and nobody knew this 400 years ago. It took the artists to paint landscape and then people realized how beautiful it is. Nowadays, artists are painting 
uh, pictures of damp, stained walls and floors where people have dropped a lot of paint. And one day people will walk into a room where there's a lot of paint that's scattered on the floor and a general thing and they'll say, my goodness, it's just like a Jackson Pollock. <laughs> oh, ain't it just like a picture? <laughs> See? It always takes the artist to show us the vision. But of course, in the meantime, it is difficult. You go to an exhibition of contemporary non-objective painting, and a kind of square fellow walks in there and he says, that's not what I call a picture. Because he is against his prejudices. <laughs> but I say to people now, uh, excuse me, wait a minute. Take a look at that again. I'm going to tell you something. That painting is a colored photograph of guess what? And he looks at it in astonishment, with entirely new eyes. What could that be a photograph of? He begins to see it might be a photograph through a microscope of globules, of germs floating in liquid. It might be anything. There it is. It suddenly comes at him. Goodness knows whether that was what the artist intended, but that's a method of giving people a shock, of seeing things in a new way. You know, a GI visited Picasso in Paris during the war and said, I can't understand your paintings. They're, they're absurd. Life doesn't look like that. Picasso said, do you have a girlfriend? He said, yes. Have you a picture? He said, yes. Show it. So he drew out his billfold and there was a little colored photograph of his girlfriend and Picasso looked at it and said, is she so small as that? <laughs> now then, the, the, the idea of Li, the idea of natural order, is like this patterns on foam, patterns in jade, the shapes of the clouds, the shapes of trees and mountains. They are orderly, but we cannot put our finger on the order. We know it's orderly, but we don't know why. And we know it's completely different from a mess. From a mess. The order of nature is in that way then indefinable. We, when St. Augustine was asked, what is time? He said, I know what it is, but when you ask me, I don't. So in the same way, the Chinese would say, we know what the order of nature is, but if you ask us, we don't. The poet says, picking chrysanthemums along the eastern fence, gazing in silence at the southern hills, the birds fly home through the soft mountain air of dusk. In all these things there is a deep meaning, but when we are about to express it, we suddenly forget the words. That's Lee. Nature as a self-ordering principle, but it doesn't really know how it does it. Another poem says, if you want to know where the flowers come from, even the god of spring doesn't know. This is a very remarkable attitude to nature. Politically, you see, if you translate this into politics, it is a high philosophical anarchy. And there's a lot to be said for this as a political point of view. That, in other words, government is always a mess. Because the state opposes itself to the people. We live under a constitution where we are supposed to be governed by ourselves. Somebody once said, down with democracy when we get it. <laughs> because the state 
always, the government always creates itself as a business in competition with all the other businesses. And it wins, because it's the biggest one of the bunch. The, the Taoists said of the state that it should be as anonymous and as unobtrusive as possible. That is to say that the emperor, instead of going around in procession and being heralded and flags waved, should be as unobtrusive as the uh, head of the sanitation department. You know, he's a man, just a guy who goes around in a plain ordinary suit and uh, really attends to his job. And the, the head of uh, the sanitation of the city of Dallas uh, goes around, you don't have a police escort and sirens blowing and flags waving. He simply does his job. And the feeling of Lao Tzu is that the president or the emperor should have the same kind of attitude. That he should simply help the people and retire and not claim any merits for it. Always withdraw himself, always be behind the scenes, not striving for power, but simply to help things along. Govern a great state, he said, as he would cook a small fish. Now, you know, when you've got a small fish in the frying pan, don't keep tossing it around and fidgeting with the spatula, otherwise it'll fall apart. Do it gently. Softly, softly, catch him up. So then, here is a conception of nature as something you must trust. Outside nature, the birds, the bees, the flowers, the mountains, the clouds, and inside nature, human nature. Now, nature isn't trustworthy completely. It'll sometimes let you down to the wallop. But that's the risk you take. That's the risk of life. What's the alternative? I do not trust nature at all. It's got to be watched. You know what that leads to? It leads to 1984 and Big Brother. It leads to the totalitarian state where everybody is his brother's policeman where everybody is watching everybody else to report them to the authorities, where you can't trust your own motivation, where you have to have a psychoanalyst in charge of you all the time to think, to be sure that you don't think dangerous thoughts or peculiar thoughts. And you report all peculiar thoughts to your analyst, and your analyst keeps a record of them and reports them to the government. <laughs> And everybody is busy keeping records of everything. It's much more important to record what happens than what happens. This is already eating us up. It's much more important that you have your books right and that you conduct your business in a good way. In universities, it's much more important that the registrar's records be in order than that the library be well stocked. After all, do you know your grades are all locked up in safes and they're protected from thievery and pilfering, and they're the most valuable property that the university has. <laughs> the library can go hang. <laughs> then furthermore, the main function of a university is, what any sensible person would imagine, of to teach students and to do research. So the faculty should be the most important thing in the university. On the contrary, the administration is the most important thing. The people who keep the records, who make the game rules up. So the faculty are always being obstructed by the administration and being forced to attend irrelevant meetings and uh, to do everything but scholarship. Do you know what scholarship means? What a school means? The original meaning of a scholar? Leisure. We talked of a scholar and a gentleman because a gentleman was a person who had a private income. And he could afford to be a scholar. He didn't have to earn a living 
Therefore, he could study the classics, poetry, and things like that. Today, nothing is more busy than a school. They make you work, 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 because you get cut through on schedule. They have expedited courses, and you, you, you go to school so as to get a union card, a PhD, or something, so that you can earn a living. That's the whole contradiction of scholarship. Scholarship is to study everything that's unimportant. Not necessary for survival. All the charming irrelevances of life. But you see, the thing is this, if you don't have a room in your life for the playful, life's not worth living. All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. But if the only reason for which Jack plays is that he can work better afterwards, he's not really playing. He's playing because it's good for him. <laughs> he's not playing at all. You have to be able to be a true scholar. You have to cultivate an attitude to life where you're not trying to get anything out of it. You pick up a pebble on the beach. Look at it. Beautiful. Don't try and get a sermon out of it. Sermons in stones and God in everything be damned. Just enjoy it. Don't feel that you've got to salve your conscience by saying that this is for the advancement of your aesthetic understanding. Enjoy the pebble. If you do that, you become healthy. You become able to be a loving, helpful human being. But if you can't do that, if you can only do things because they are somehow you're going to get something out of it, you're a vulture. So, we have to learn, we don't have to, you know, you don't have to do anything, you don't have to go on living, but it's a great idea, it's a great thing, if you can learn what the Chinese call purposelessness. They think nature is purposeless. When we say something's purposeless, that's put down. There's no future in it wash out. But when they hear the word purposeless, they think that's just great. It's like the waves washing against the shore, going on and on and on forever with no meaning. The great Zen master said as his death poem, just before he died, from the bathtub to the bathtub, I have uttered stuff and nonsense. The bathtub in which the baby is washed at birth, bathtub in which the corpse is washed before burial. All this time I have said many nonsense. Like the birds in the trees go, tree, 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 what's it all about? Everybody tries to say, oh, it's, it's mating call. It's purposeful. Trying to get their mate, you know, attract them with song. That's why they have color. Butterflies have eyes on them. Self-protection. Engineering view of the universe. <laughs> Why do that? They say, well, it's because they need to survive. Well, why survive? What's that for? <coughs> well, to survive. See, human beings are really a lot of tubes. And uh, all living creatures are just tubes. And these tubes have to put things in at one end and let it out at the other. Then they get clever about it and they develop nerve ganglia on one end of the tube, the eating end, called a head. And that's and it's got eyes in it, it's got ears in it, it's got little organs, antenna and things like this. And that helps you to find things to put in one end so that you can let them out the other. <laughs> well, while you're doing this, you see, the stuff going through wears the tube out. <laughs> and so, that the show can go on, the tubes have complicated ways of making other tubes who will go on doing the same thing, in at one end, out the other. And they say, well, that's terribly serious. That's awfully important. We've got to keep on doing it. <laughs> but when Chinese say nature is purposeless, this is a compliment. It's like the idea of the Japanese have a, a word, uh, yugen. And they describe yugen as watching wild geese fly and be hidden in the clouds. As watching a ship vanish behind a distant island. 
as wandering on and on in a great forest with no thought of return. Haven't you done this? Haven't you gone on a walk with no particular purpose in mind? Carry a stick with you and you occasionally hit at old stumps, wander along, sometimes twiddle your thumbs. It's at that moment that you are a perfectly rational human being. You've learned purposelessness. All music is purposeless. Is music getting somewhere? If it were, I mean, if the aim of music were, of a symphony, were to get to the final bar, the best conductor would be the one who got there fastest. <laughs> See, dancing, when you dance, do you aim to arrive at a particular place on the floor? Is that the idea of dancing? <laughs> the aim of dancing is to dance is the present. Well, it's exactly the same with our life. We think life has a purpose. I remember the preachers used to say, when I was a small boy, I'd always hear it. We must follow God's purpose, his purpose for you and his purpose for me. When I asked these cats what the purpose was, they never, never knew. They didn't know what it was. They had a hymn. God is working his purpose out as year succeeds the year. God is working his purpose out and the time is drawing near. <laughs> the time when the earth shall be full of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. What's the glory of God? Well, they weren't quite sure. I'll tell you what it is. In heaven, all those angels are gathered round the glory of God. That is to say, the witch than which there is no witcher. Catholics call it the beatific vision, the Jews call it the Shekinah. They're all those angels. And they're standing around it and they're saying, Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. It means nothing. <laughs> they're just having a ball. <laughs> See, that's what happened in the beginning. When God created the universe, it was created like all stars, all planets, all galaxies. They're vaguely spherical. He created this and he said, have a ball. <laughs> But before, before he said that, he said, you must draw the line somewhere. That was the real thing he said first. Before, let there be light. That came later. First thing was, you must draw the line somewhere. Otherwise, nothing will happen. You know, you've got to have the good guys, the bad guys. You've got to have this, you've got to have that. Black, white, light, darkness. You must draw the line somewhere. Now, here's the choice. Are you going to trust it or not? If you do trust it, you may get let down. And this it is yourself, your own nature, and all nature around you. There are going to be mistakes. But if you don't trust it at all, you're going to strangle yourself. You're going to fence yourself round with rules and regulations and laws and prescriptions and policemen and guards, and who's going to guard the guards, and who's going to look after Big Brother to be sure that he doesn't do something stupid. No go. First thing, I get annoyed with somebody in the audience, and I'm going to throw this ashtray at them. But I don't want to hit my friend sitting next to that person. I want to be absolutely sure this ashtray hits that individual. And so I don't trust myself to throw it. I have to carry it along and be sure I hit that person on the head. See, I don't throw it because I can't let go of it. To throw it, I must let go of it. To live, I must have faith. I must trust myself to the totally unknown. I must trust myself to a nature which doesn't have a boss because a boss is a system of mistrust. That is why loves as Tao, loves and nourishes all things, but does not lord it over. Tonight, at any rate, we've got to go through some theoretical material, so we're on a head trip. I don't know where the trip will end up, it depends on you. But in order to lay the foundation for this. 
We've got to examine ideas that are basic to our common sense. Ideas are very powerful. It's not only emotions that are powerful in human life. Psychoanalysis has, of course, examined the emotional bases of human opinions and beliefs. But one should also examine the intellectual bases of psychological principles or theories or therapies. Because everybody who speaks a language at all has underneath the surface of the language or the figuring that he uses certain basic assumptions which are usually unexamined. And these unexamined systems of belief are extremely powerful in their influence over our lives. We'll begin with one very common idea that's built into our common sense, which is that the world, the physical world, consists of two aspects, respectively form and matter. This was foisted on us by Aristotle and also by the Bible, because it is said that God created man out of the dust of the earth and as it were made a figurine in his own image and then breathed the breath of life into its nostrils so that this form of clay became a living being. And so underneath that lies the notion that everything material is made of some sort of basic stuff like clay is the basis of pots. And for centuries scientists, philosophers, wanted to know what is that stuff? What are we made of? Now look here, a carpenter makes tables out of wood and a potter makes pots out of clay. But I ask you, is a tree made of wood? Obviously not. A tree is wood. It's not made of it. Is a mountain made of rock? Obviously not. It is rock. See, our language contains innumerable ghosts. Supposing I say the lightning flashes, surely the flashing is the same as the lightning. There is not one thing called lightning and another called flashing. The lightning is the flashing. It is raining. What is this it that is raining? The raining. I can make a noun out of a verb any time by turning it into a gerund. So we populate the world with ghosts which arise out of the structure of our language and thus therefore of the structure of our thinking because we think in language or in figuring in numbers. And so it's of intensely fascinating investigation to find out what are the hidden assumptions that underlie language and figuring. In other words, language and mathematics. And here is this basic assumption, you see, that is almost with us all. It comes again and again into our everyday speech, that form, pattern, organization, organisms are made of something. As if there were some inert, primordial, and of course stupid stuff, which had to be put into shape by an energy and an intelligence other than the stuff. Like the intelligence of the potter shapes the clay. So therefore, we have a basic picture of the world in which everything is being pushed around. There's a boss. There's somebody in charge who is different from what that somebody is in charge of and puts everything into shape. 
because our common sense does not allow that things shape themselves. Very odd. In Chinese, the word for nature is ziran, which is that which is so of itself, the spontaneous. The Chinese have no difficulty in thinking about nature as self-shaping. A Chinese child would not ask its mother, how was I made? It would ask its mother, how did I grow? Which would be quite different, you see. So to be made is to be commanded. And therefore every good being obeys. Whether you obey God, or whether you obey the laws of nature, you obey. And the an analog, therefore, of the world that has been put into our common sense is one of military command. Note that. Because the image of God, I would go further and say the idolatrous image of God, which has been handed down to us, is one of the beneficent tyrant the boss, Big Papa. So then, when our physicists started to find out what stuff was, they went into it and into it and examined it with ever more minute instruments. They first started cutting up things with knives and cutting them smaller and smaller and smaller until the particle that they wanted to dissect was exactly the same width as the edge of the knife. And so they got an atom. And that word in Greek, atomos, means the non-cuttable. A non-tomos cuttable. That's the basic atom. What you can't cut anymore, because you got down to the end. Well, they weren't satisfied with that. So they got an atomos, in other words, a particle of something or other that was just the same width as the blade of the, the, edge, the knife edge and they looked at it under a microscope and they saw that it was seemed to be composed of more small particles. So they found out means of working those out and then they found out extraordinary means of uh, investigating the properties of matter. Then they reached a point where they couldn't decide whether it was particles or whether it was waves. So they called them wavicles. They thought they had come to certain ultimate wavicles called electrons. But then, unfortunately, everything fall, fell apart and they found protons, mesons, and many other uh, extraordinary things. Because, of course, what they didn't realize was that as you make more and more powerful microscopic instruments. The universe has to get smaller and smaller in order to escape the investigation. Just as when the telescopes become more and more powerful, the galaxies have to recede in order to get away from the telescopes. Because what is happening in all these investigations is through us and through our eyes and senses, the universe is looking at itself. And when you try to turn around to see your own head, what happens? See? It runs away. You never get at it. You can't bite your own teeth. You can't touch the tip of this finger with the tip of this finger. This is the principle. Shankara explains it beautifully in his commentary on the Kena Upanishad, where he says that that which is the knower the ground of all knowledge is never itself an object of knowledge, just as fire doesn't burn itself. So there's always that profound mystery that you are never going to be in absolute control of what goes on, because if you were, it'd be like making love to a plastic woman. Who wants that? There always is the mystery. Uh -uh. The thing we don't know. As Van der Leeuw put it, 
The mystery of life is not a problem to be solved, but a reality to be experienced. If there were not that, you see, there would be no life. The reason why certain people turned to philosophy, why I became a philosopher, was that since I was a little boy, I always felt that existence as such was weird. I mean, here we are. Isn't that odd? Of course it's odd. What do you mean, what do you mean by odd? Well, that's what's different from even. I mean, what's odd stands out. What's even lies flat. But you can't see the outstanding without the flat background. There's no you. No. Here's the thing standing out. That's odd. Each one of you is odd. Strange, unique, particular, different. But how do we know what we mean by that? Except against the background of something even. That is not differentiated. Like space. And so you get this philosophical itch. You begin to scratch your head and think about why is that so? Well, after a while, you realize that's a meaningless question. Then you ask, how is it so? Well, that leads you into science and other investigations. So you want to know, what is it? I mean, this, this happening, this thing called existence. What is it? You ask that question long enough and it suddenly hits you that if you could answer it, you wouldn't know what terms to put the answer in. I mean, when we investigate the properties of nature, and we do get some answers, all the answers are in terms of particular structures, forms, patterns. And these can be measured, and their behavior can be predicted. But when I want to ask the question, what are the forms made of? I mean, what is it really? We can't think of any way in which we could answer the question. Because we would have to have a class of all classes. When you ask the question, what? It's like saying, is you is or is you ain't? Is you animal? Is you vegetable? Is you mineral? Are you a Republican or a Democrat? Are you male or female? Are you a Christian or a Jew or a Hindu or what have you? We classify always to give an answer to the question, what is it? And when you classify, you distinguish an inside group from an outside group. Right. So what we want to know is what is the group of all groups? Well, we can't imagine what the outside would be. So we can't answer the question. What is it? So the physicists finally abandoned the quest for stuff. And they gave us a description of the universe entirely in terms of form. The pattern, not the stuff. When people ask, what's the word? Yeah, but you can't do that. What's the pattern made of? Surely there mustn't be an answer to that. See, what happens is, when you turn up the microscope, all stuff turns into form. It becomes articulate. You know, the carpet uh, looks like some sort of stuff. But when you look at it under a microscope, you will see the crystalline structure of the nylon or whatever it's made of. See? They want to know what are those crystals made of. All right? Turn up the volume and you'll find uh, molecules. Turn up the volume. you find wavicles. 
but we think the, the, the wavicles must be of something. But of course they're not. We find substance or stuff totally vanishes. And we're left with form. Sanskrit doesn't really have a word for matter. It has namarupa, which means name, form. It's the form that matters. Or let's put it in another way, everything is a matter of form. <laughs> now let's go into this, it's fascinating. They say, does it matter? What does that mean? Does it matter? Is it important? In other words, does it measure up to anything? All right, let's go back to the Indo-European roots of the language. Matter comes from a Sanskrit root, matra, which means to measure. Lay out the foundations, say, for a building. So from this root, matra, we get going on into Sanskrit, we get the word maya. And maya is generally translated illusion, although it also means magic, creative power. The word illusion, switch over, we get that from Latin. And that comes from the Latin ludere, to play. Let's pretend that we matter. <laughs> and so, also from the root matra, see, you get meter. That is also to measure. You get mitir in Greek, mater in Latin, which means mama mother the mother of Buddha was called Maya Mary Ma again is the mother of Jesus Ma 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 but Ma you see is a matter of form Pattern. The Chinese call the basic principle of nature Li, and the character for Li means the markings in jade, the fiber in muscle, the grain in wood. So Joseph Needham translates it organic pattern. And that's what's going on. And there isn't any stuff involved. What stuff is, is a pattern seen out of focus, where it becomes fuzzy. Like kapok, see? We say kapok is the stuffing of a cushion. And that's stuff. It's, you know, some kind of goop. But when we examine the kapok closely, we find structure. And th that's what you will find, and there never will be anything else. Crazy. Because it completely flouts our common sense. We say, but surely, when philosophers beat tables that are in front of them. And you know, they say, it is there, because bang, you know, there must be something that is stuff, that is substantial. But the only reason why you can't pass your hand through a table is the table's moving too fast. <laughs> it's like trying to put your finger through an electric fan, only it's going much faster than an electric fan. Anything solid is going so fast that there's no way to get this through it. That's all. So, you say, what is it that is going so fast? Well, that question is based on a, a grammatical illusion. The grammatical illusion is that all verbs have to have subjects. Can you imagine anything more weird than the idea that a verb or an action or event must be set into motion by a noun. That is to say, a non-event or thing. Now what's the difference between a thing and an event? 
I can't, for the life of me, tell. We say this is a fist. <coughs> That's a noun. What happens to it when I open my hand? This thing has unaccountably disappeared. So I should have called this a fisting. And this is a handing. It may also be a pointing. So we, we, we could devise a language such as that of the Nootka Indians, where there are no nouns, there are only verbs. Chinese is very close to that. I think the superimposition of the idea of noun and verb on the Chinese language is a Western invention. I can't think of any Chinese word for a noun. But the, all those languages of Indo-European origin have nouns and verbs in them. They have agents and operations. And that's one of the basic snags when we divide the world into operations and agents, doers and doings, then we ask such silly questions as, who knows? Who does it? What does it? When the what that is supposed to do it is the same as the doing. And you could very easily see that the whole process of the universe may be understood as process. Nobody's doing it. Because when you go back to doing it, you go back to the military analogy, the chain of command. <coughs> the bus who goes bang and the object obeys. It's a very crude idea. Very unsophisticated. So, if you could bear it, we have suddenly eliminated a spook. And the spook was called stuff. So we are now more at ease with ourselves in a world of form, Namarupa. Named forms. Well, we can of course get rid of the names. We can uh, go further and try the experiment of not calling the forms by any names. Just observing the forms, although when we've got rid of the names, we can't even call them forms. Because that's a name. And there's the, the, the bazaars going on, which uh, Buddhists call tathata. And that means suchness or thusness. Actually, tathata is da da da. Because when a baby first talks, it says da. And fathers flatter themselves that it's saying da da, daddy. It isn't. It's saying da. And so the Upanishads say da dvamasi. You're it. <laughs> the basic da. But da doesn't mean anything. Da is like everything else. See, the world is a musical phenomenon. Good music never refers to anything except the music itself. You don't ask Mr. Bach, Mr. Ravi Shankar, what do you mean by this music? What is it intended to express? Bad music always expresses something other than itself, like the 1812 Overture or the Sunken Cathedral. Good music never talks about anything other than the music. If you ask Bach, what is your meaning? He say, listen, that's the meaning. Giraffes are giraffing, trees are treeing, stars are starring, clouds are clouding, rain is raining. And if you don't understand, look at it again. <laughs> and people are people. Wow. We notice that all these 
suchnesses appear and disappear. They keep changing, they come and they go. But if you get hung up on your particular form, I'll have to alter the language a little bit because you see, your form makes a duality. Whereas you are your form. You're what you're doing. Now you think, hmm, for some strange reason I must make that go on as long as possible. And therefore you think you have an instinct to survive. And so the only thing anybody can agree about today, so far as the discussion of ethical and moral problems are concerned, is that we ought to survive. And therefore certain forms of conduct have survival value and certain forms don't. But when you say to yourself, you must go on living, you put yourself in a double bind. Because you said to a process which is essentially spontaneous, that it must happen. And the basic form of the double bind which is imposed upon all children, is you are required to do that which will be acceptable only if you do it voluntarily. So when we say to ourselves, you must go on, the reason is, you see, that we are not living in the eternal now, where reality is. We are always thinking that the satisfaction of life will be coming later. There's a good time coming, be it ever so far away that one far-off divine event to which all creation moves. Don't kid yourself. As the Hindus have taught us, in the course of time, everything gets worse. <laughs> it eventually falls apart. <laughs> Comes Kali Yuga and Shiva at the end, and boom! Which is to say, only suckers put hope in the future. You see, I tell you, there are three classes of people in the Western world. The aristocrats, the proletariat, and the bourgeoisie. The aristocrats live on the past because they come of noble family. And they're like potatoes because the best part of them is underground. <laughs> the proletariat live in the present because they have nothing else and the poor bourgeoisie live for the future they are the eternal suckers they can always open to a con game so when they find out that really, uh, th there isn't much of a future. You're going to die. They transpose the future into a spiritual dimension. And they figure, uh, this material world is not the real world, uh, but the, the spiritual world is the real world. And there will be somewhere, somehow, an eternal life for me. A charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, a never dying soul to save and fit it for the sky. Well then they say to them, what are you going to do there? Well they have the faintest idea. You know that? If you ask theologians about what they think is going to happen in heaven, they just dry up. I'm oh, going to play harps. I mean, there's a symbolic meaning to that which I could go into, but the average person's idea of heaven is an absolute bore. I mean, it's like being in church forever. Children see this immediately. Children, when they hear a hymn like, Weary of earth and laden with my sin, I looked at heaven and longed to enter in. They think, oh God. <laughs> 
Heaven is to be in church for always. And they think hell is preferable. <laughs> There's at least some excitement going on. And you see it in medieval art. You take, you go to the Metropolitan Museum in New York and you see Jan van Eyck's painting of the Last Judgment. Heaven on top, hell below. In heaven, everybody's looking as that, like the cat that swallowed the canary, sitting in rows and very smug. God the Father is president and, uh, oh dear. <laughs> Beneath this, there's a winged skull, like a bat, and squirming bodies, all nude, <laughs> all being eaten by snakes and I don't know, it's a fantastic thing going on. But in that, you see, Van Eyck had a ball painting that. Because in, in, in medieval way, it was the only way you could get away with painting nudes. <laughs> and sexy scenes, sadomasochistic, see? So that's naturally why hell became much more interesting than heaven. <laughs> So, therefore, this hope for the future is a hoax. It's a perfect hoax. But maybe we, we will make spiritual progress. Everybody puts it off. Maybe if I work at yoga for 10 years, 20 years, and uh, do, do this thing, I will eventually make it to moksha, to nirvana, whatever. That's nothing more than a postponement. It's this business of, because you're not fully alive now, you think maybe someday you will be. Look, supposing I ask you, what did you do yesterday? Now, what did I do yesterday? I've, in fact, I've forgotten. So, but most people will say, well, let me see now. Let me get out my notebook. I got up at uh, 7.30 and I brushed my teeth and I read the newspaper over a cup of coffee and then I looked at the clock and dressed and uh, got in the car and drove downtown and did this and that in the office and so on and you go on and on and on and you suddenly discover that what you've described has absolutely nothing to do with what happened. You've described a scraggly, skeletal, fleshless list of abstractions. Whereas if you were actually aware of what went on, you could never describe it. Because nature is multidimensional, language is linear, language is scrawny. And therefore, if you identify the world as it is with the way the world is described, it's as if you were trying to eat dollar bills and expect a nutritious diet. Or eat numbers. A lot of people eat numbers. People play the stock market. They're doing nothing but eating numbers. And they're always unhappy. Absolutely miserable. Because they never get anything. So therefore, they always hope more is coming. Because they believe that if they eat enough dollar bills, eventually, something satisfactory will happen. So, eating the abstractions all the time, we want more, more, more time. Confucius very wisely said, a man who understands the Tao in the morning may die with content in the evening. Because when you understand, you don't put your hope in time. Time won't solve a thing. So when we enter into the, the, the practice of meditation, of yoga, we are doing something radically unlike other human activities. Of course, the way yoga is sold in the United States, like everything else, is that it's supposed to be good for you. 
It isn't. It has nothing to do with anything that's good for you. It's the one activity which you do for its own sake and not because it's good for you, not because it will lead anywhere, because you cannot go to the place where you are now, obviously. The yoga is to be completely here and now. Why the word yoga means join. Get with it. Be completely here and now. This is the real meaning of concentration, to be in your center. And the Christian word for sinning in Greek is amatanin, which means to miss the point. And the point is eternal life, which is here and now. Come to your senses. <laughs> so yoga is defined in Sanskrit in the Yoga Sutra Yoga Chitta Priti Nirodha difficult to translate but roughly yoga is the stopping of uh, Briti is turning see like a wheel and chitta is consciousness. Turnings in consciousness. In other words, the attempt of the mind to catch hold of itself, which is what we call thinking, worrying. So we could say loosely, yoga is the cessation of thinking. It's not the cessation of awareness, but of symbolizing, trying to catch, touch, Reality in terms of thoughts, symbols, descriptions, definitions. Give it up. It's not easy because we do it habitually. But until there is silence of the mind, it is almost impossible to understand eternal life, that is to say, eternal now. If you could come to the place where you suspend conceptions, conceptions in Sanskrit are called vikalpa, and so this state is called near vikalpa, not conceptual. And this it will be basic to everything I'm going to talk to you about. To understand non-verbal reality, non-conceived reality, what I call suchness, tathata. It's really very easy, it's too easy, that's why it's difficult. But that when you are fully aware and not thinking, you will notice some amazing uh, absences there is no past. Can you hear anything past, incidentally? Can you hear anything future? They're just not there to the plain sense of one's ears. Ears are easiest to begin with. Can you hear anyone listening to something else other than sound, you know? Can you hear the listener? No? Well then presumably it's not there. When you become again as a child and simply forget all that you ever were told and contemplate what is, all these ghosts go away. And weird. But they just go. And then you enter into the eternal state. Well, there's no problem. William, you go back and you collect your opinions again. You think, well, that won't do. 
how, how can I be practical and be in that sort of state? Well, I remember in the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus said um, a lot of things about this. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet, Suleiman in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. And if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, faithless ones? Wow. So, do not worry about tomorrow, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or how shall we clothe ourselves? Oh, the rabble seeks after these things. Sufficient to the day is the worry of it. Nobody ever preaches a sermon on that text. Never, I've heard lots of sermons. Never one on that, because people say, look, that's all very well, because Jesus was the boss's son. <laughs> and, and he knew, you see, that he was really in charge of the universe, and he's nothing to worry about. But we have to be practical. Oh, what do you suppose the gospel was? The good news. You know, it never got out. <laughs> you too are the boss's son. <clears throat> that was the gospel. If Jesus had lived in India, they wouldn't have put him to death. Because everybody in India knows that we're all God in disguise. So if he had said, I and the Father are one, in India, they would have said, hooray, you know? <laughs> Lots of people in India know that perfectly well. But here, uh, 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 that's a no-no. <laughs> Who the hell do you think you are? You own the place? You keep your position. You're just a creature, a critter. It's in the family system, it's in everything. Because they have their own way of doing it in India. Uh, because um, they have a delayed action on it. When you get to be a certain age and after you've studied long enough with a certain guru, then and then only may you realize this. But until then, uh, 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 it's a still a no-no. But if you put in the time, they finally let you in. Here you have to wait until you're dead. <laughs> well, uh, the only place to begin is now. Because here's where we are. So why put it off? A lot of people say, well, I'm not ready. What do you mean you're not ready? What do you, what, what, what do you have to be to be ready? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not good enough because I'm neurotic. I'm uh, perhaps not old enough, not mature enough. For such knowledge, I uh, still am frightened of pain. And of course, I'd have to overcome that. I'm still uh, dependent on material things. I have to, you know, eat a lot, drink a lot, and uh, sex around, and all that kind of thing. And uh, I, I think that uh, I better get all that under control first. Oh. You mean you've got a case of spiritual pride? You, you, you want to be able to congratulate yourself for having gone through the discipline which is rewarded with realization. That is trying to quench fire with fire. In other words, the reason, you know, 
Wouldn't it be great to be a mystic? Look at it this way. I mean, crazy. <laughs> to have no fear, no attachments, no hang-ups. To be as free as the air. So that, uh, you know, you could just wander out in the streets and uh, give away all your clothes to the beggars and uh, let go of the whole thing, let it all hang out. Wouldn't it be crazy to have that courage? You look into yourself honestly. You find that inside you're actually a quaking mess of sensitivity. <laughs> no? So that this desire to be the great mystic is nothing more than a symptom of your quaking mess. It's self-defense. So you think, wow, oh, we we'll do, we'll do that yoga bit and we'll get real tough. But that only means you're going to be increasingly insensitive. Running away from the quaking mess, escaping. You never can. You're stuck with it. There's nothing you can actually do to transform your own nature into unattached selflessness. Because you have a selfish reason for wanting to do it. Well, that's pretty depressing, isn't it? You mean to tell me that the only people who get really enlightened and liberated are those whom the grace of God somehow hits in an arbitrary way? And all you can do is sit around and wait? Well, let's begin with that supposition. Let's suppose there's nothing we can do to change ourselves. No. Psychotherapy, religion, all this is absolutely in vain. There's nothing, nothing, nothing you can do about it. By trying, as I said, to bite your own teeth. Or lift yourself up by your own bootstraps. Incidentally, it struck me as funny, a lot of people are using that phrase in the wrong way. They say when uh, something very difficult has to be done, we have to lift ourselves up by our own bootstraps. You can't! It's impossible. That's, uh, that's terribly de depressing. You mean, Alan, whilst you come here simply to tell us that there's nothing we can do? I mean, here uh, we are all presumably assembled in a cultural uh, milieu, spiritual milieu, psychotherapeutic milieu, where we are supposed to get better. And I tell you, there's nothing you could do about it. Well, I say, give us our money back. <laughs> Go to somebody else who'll be more encouraging. <laughs> but, But what does it mean that you can't do anything about it? It's singing loud and clear. The reason you can't do anything about it is that you don't exist. That is, as an ego, as a soul, separate will just isn't there well when you understand that you're liberated <laughs> they say in Zen you cannot take hold of it nor can you get rid of it in not being able to get it you get it when you are silent it speaks when you speak it is silent now don't misunderstand me this is not any kind of fatalism when I say, you as you conceive yourself to be, that is your ego, your image of yourself, isn't there. It doesn't exist. It's an abstraction. It's like three. Do you ever see three? It's plain, ordinary, three? No, nobody ever saw it. It's, it's a concept, it's a vikalpa. So in the same way as oneself. There's the happening, the suchness, yes, sure, you bet. But it's not pushing you around because there's no you to be pushed around. In other words, there's no billiard ball on the end of the queue. There's the queue. No, 
it, it goes this way and goes that way. They call a Buddha a Tathagata, one who comes or goes thus. This way and that way. See? He went that away. <laughs> so, uh, the, the, this illusion of the persecuted ego who is pushed around by fate is, is, is altogether disappeared. And so, in likewise, the illusion of the ego who pushes fate around has also disappeared. There's a happening. So, in this, do you see what has happened? By dying to yourself, by having become completely incompetent and found that you don't exist, you're reborn. You become everything. In the words of Sir Edwin Arnold, foregoing self, the universe grows I. 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 I hope you sleep.